Thank you all for being here. Uh, welcome. We will kick off this NACI meeting uh, and bring it officially to order. Uh, before I hand it over to Alejandra, let me start by thanking our colleagues here at EOB in the White House for hosting us. Uh, it's a lovely room and a great venue for us to celebrate uh, the work that you all have done on this recommendation. Um, it's been a really densely packed 21 or so months since you all started. Um, we, uh, in the interim, things have happened like the Chips and Science Act passed, the Tech Hubs program got funded and kicked off. Um, your mission to develop this recommendation got perhaps a little derailed or at least turned around um, and you helped us out with that Tech Hubs program, which we are now deep into the implementation of, and then you pivoted right back to this. Um, I think this is a really exciting set of recommendations. Um, it is a very strong way for us to uh, think about how we can better support entrepreneurs and how that can be beneficial to communities all throughout the United States. Um, I'm really excited for all the work that you've done for culminating that here, um, for being able to kind of present this recommendation to the secretary. Um, and we are really grateful for your service here. Um, I hope you found this to be rewarding as well. Let me hand it over to uh, Assistant Secretary Alejandro Castillo. Good morning. Um, thank you, Eric. And, and good morning, everyone. It's always great to see everyone. Um, and I know you travel from many distant places, California, Colorado, and every uh, state in between. Um, let me just say uh, a very um, thank you to uh, Peter, who many of you know now, who was a... <clears throat> who kept us th uh, true to this process. But as Eric said, um, since the secretary re-established uh, NACI back in May of 2022, um, the journey has been an interesting one. Uh, great uh, successes, both uh, uh, in terms of the Biden-Harris administration, as he mentioned, and we should never forget, bipartisan infrastructure law, American Rescue Plan, Inflation Reduction Act, and the Chips and Science Act. Um, you've heard me say this over and over again, and I'll probably say this until I die, a historic moment for our country, truly historic transformational moment for our country. And at times uh, we struggle with the messaging because these are very, very large um, endeavors. Um, but how do they impact uh, not only people on the ground, but how do they impact the trajectory of our, of our country's um, uh, future? So on both, on both ends, I will say that um, this is truly investing in America. Um, and I, I hope that not only do you uh, see it, but you have all been um, architects of this extraordinary report. Um, and I, I, I also want to thank the EDA team for lifting this up. And you, you probably have a little flyer which has the QR code. But I'm excited to, uh, to announce the competitiveness through entrepreneurship, a strategy, a strategy for innovation. Uh, the work done has been monumental. And I want to thank each and every one of you. Um, each and every one of you found your voices uh, uh, and your expertise in this report. Uh, we also had a fantastic editor in, in Neil. Um, but it was about putting together recommendations that not only uh, lifted up what is occurring today with regards to uh, all the uh, investments that are happening, but how do we stimulate, motivate, um, invest in our entrepreneurial ecosystem? Um, I also want to say that the 10 recommendations, and I uh, really focused on research and development, entrepreneurial ecosystem, talent pipeline, incentives for intellectual property and commercialization, which I'm delighted that my colleague um, Kathy Vidal is here from Undersecretary for U.S. Patent and Trademark. Um, this is definitely uh, the beginning of a, another journey. Many of you have asked, uh, is this it? Uh, and I will tell you, no, this is the beginning. Uh, we have put together a, a, uh, these set of recommendations, um, and I strongly believe that if this just lives in a shelf, then we have uh, wasted time. That is not the goal here. The goal is to pivot from actually putting the plan together, the recommendations together, and now pivoting to the, to the implementation 
and to uh, making sure that these recommendations um, are heard by the various entities. Um, these recommendations also lift up the urgent need to make sure that Tech Hubs is fully funded. Uh, just a reminder, the deadline for Tech Hubs' uh, second notice of funding opportunity is February 29th. I'm sure none of you are involved in this. Um, but the, the importance of Tech Hub is, is again, um, a key component to driving uh, innovation and, and making sure that as the U.S., we are investing in those critical technologies that will ensure both our competitiveness but also secure um, and, and protect um, through our national security uh, priorities. Um, as many of you know, Tech Hubs is a, was authorized at $10 billion. We received half a billion dollars. Um, so this first phase of Tech Hubs um, has brought together some of the most um, amazing proposals, amazing uh, coalitions and consortiums. Um, and it's going to be a very, very, very hard um, selection. But it is so wonderful to be in the room when we review these because you see the richness of the talent. You see the richness of the possibilities. So um, as we take on these recommendations, both at the Department of Commerce, there are recommendations for Congress to consider. And that's where not only will we, um, as, uh, as, as, as NACI, as part of NACI, um, that's the work we have in front of us. Um, in the coming months, um, you'll see uh, continuing uh, work out of EDA. Um, uh, Steve Case asked me, what's going on at EDA? And I said, oh, just a couple of things. <laughs> just a couple of things. Uh, among them, Tech Hubs uh, also recompete, which we also announced the finalist. Um, but more importantly, how do we continue to evolve EDA and make sure that EDA receives the, the requisite support to continue this work. Um, this work does not end uh, today. It doesn't end um, at the end of this year. It actually, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the work that NACI will continue to do um, in the coming months. Um, know that EDA's team is here for you. Um, as I like to say, um, there's always a lot of room for some good trouble. Um, and. Uh, we have a talented team of individuals and colleagues across the Department of Commerce. You will hear from the Secretary uh, later on this morning, but I really want this to be a very rich um, discussion because each and every one of you has a unique tool in your toolbox that we are going to need to put in play in order to make this a true reality. So with that, thank you very much. And, and Eric, as always, thank you for all the great work. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for making the effort to come to Washington for this meeting to formalize the, the, this report and approve the report. And welcome to the White House. Thank you to the White House team for accommodating our request to, to meet here. And thank you also to the Commerce team that has been working, as you all know, literally around the clock, particularly in the last uh, few weeks to including Pete over there is in the corner because he's trying to nap, I think. Uh, you know, the last minute edits <laughs> were fast and furious even yesterday when, when, when we kind of were locked on things. But it just shows you the passion everybody has for this report and making sure we, we get it uh, right. Just to remind us, you know, how we got to now, uh, when we first met uh, almost two years ago, uh, the charge really was to make sure America would continue to lead. You know, we, we talked about how 250 years ago, America was just a startup and, and a, you know, like many startups, almost failed a few times, but somehow, some way, became the leading economy in the world, and that was because of innovation and entrepreneurship. You know, that's how, how we established this, you know, this lead, but we all knew and talked about it a couple of years ago that we're seeing the globalization of entrepreneurship. We're seeing you know, global competition. China gets most of the attention, but many other countries have stepped up their efforts, so there's no guarantee that America would continue to be the most innovative entrepreneurial nation. It takes 
policy and, and a lot of people focusing on it to make it work. So the challenge, and I think this report reflects it, is, is what are the steps necessary for America to continue to lead and, and win in the technology of the future, win in the industries of the future, but do it in a more inclusive way that brings along more people and more places that often have been uh, kind of left behind. I think uh, we started by breaking into a number of different you know, work groups and subcommittees and a lot of effort happened and we kind of a few times resorted it, coalesced it into what now is the three pillars and the, and the 10 recommendations. I really do think this, this can move things forward in an important way. As, as Alejandro said, a lot of the discussion after we formally approve the report is going to be on the implementation, how do we actually turn some of these things into reality. So that will be most of the focus of the discussion uh, today. So it isn't just a report on the shelf. But for now, I just wanted to thank you for all your hard work over the past you know, you know, couple of years to get us to a, you know, a report that I think really can move the ball forward. I'd also like to turn it over to and thank Christina, who has really stepped up in a major way when, when she uh, stepped aside last summer from uh, running Ohio State, uh, the Ohio State University, not Ohio State, <laughs> the Ohio State University. It was, it was bad for Ohio State and bad for, bad for Ohio, but great for NACI and great for the country because <laughs> she's really been able to spend a, a ton of time on this and taking the lead on, on a lot of the work. So, Christina, I'll turn it over to you and thank you. Well, thank you. Excellent. I, I am an electrical engineer. Yeah. <laughs> so um, anyway, I would also like to add uh, my thanks to the Department of Commerce and also the co-chairs, you know, Steve, Kathy, Alejandra, and Poncho will be with us later today. And uh, Eric, Pete, and Lakshmi were uh, constant uh, companions. And uh, in fact, our first recommendation really came from Eric, but I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so, you know, Steve, positioned well, the framework and, and what we're doing. I think all of us, and I'll speak from myself as well, discovered that in order to win the growth industries of the future and to do it in a more inclusive way, we need to find, develop, and fund entrepreneurs in more demographies and geographies. And with that sort of setting the, the stage, all of us, we organized, as, as uh, Steve said, into three pillars. And we had four principles and their 10 recommendations in this report. The pillars, I know you know this, but they're growing industries of the future. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that because we wanna make sure that the growth industries of the future also rely on local and regional place-based entrepreneurship. And that's something that this report has really captured in my opinion. We don't wanna leave any entrepreneurs behind. And uh, I just recently was, um, working with some folks in the quantum area, and some of the things that they need the most of are gonna come from smaller $10 million a year companies that are deep tech, but can actually reproduce components that are necessary for the quantum computers and quantum information uh, systems of the future. So it really underscored even more um, the passion for local as well as global entrepreneurs. Uh, and then last is you know developing the entrepreneurs in, in talent. Each pillar, as you know, has findings, and these findings led to recommendations. Uh, and then, just to summarize the four underlying principles, our economic and national security depends on continuing to leverage cutting edge research and development, and that support of research is critically important, and that is also borne out in the first set of recommendations. The second um, underlying principle is that access to capital, mentors, uh, new technology, IP, uh, protection and education, and thank you, Kathy, for that uh, in input, which was huge. That's our ecosystem and our networks uh, that we need to bring to bear. Um, U.S. should engage and promote entrepreneurship everywhere, and that's, again, no entrepreneur left behind. And then lastly, um, entrepreneurship is a skill that can be learned, cultivated, and disseminated. So with those as the, the principles, the first five recommendations speak to pillar one. And I mentioned earlier that the first one really came from a coffee Eric and I had, which is to establish a National Innovation Council chaired by the director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy that would involve cabinet members and is very similar to the green cabinet that was established during uh, the Obama-Biden administration where cabinet members would come together and figure out how can we further the uh, greening of our, of our country. 
So that was recommendation one. I think that that's a, a huge one. The second is in restoring what primes the pump in entrepreneurship, especially for high growth industries. And that is what is our percentage of federally funded uh, R&D as a percentage of the gross domestic product? It's about 0.7%, if I've got that right. We are recommending we grow it to 2%. So it's almost a tripling, and we think that's critical. Uh, the next one is launching a National Innovation Accelerator Network, and that came from the Moonshot Group, and we thank you because I think that's critically important is how these networks will bring together the capital, the people, the mentors, uh, and moving forward. Pardon? Uh, okay. Um, and then coming back again to um, Under Secretary Vidal, what you talked about, which is to provide intellectual property incentives and education. Um, you know, if you think about an industry, and I remember uh, talking with um, uh, Nick D'Onofrio, if you know him, he used to be the head of, um, you know, global uh, research for IBM. He said, for every million dollars in research, we should get a patent. Well, if you look in best of class right now in universities, they do pretty well, but it's about 20 patents per 100 million in research. So that really should be 100. But how are we going to do that? Because with Baidol, it costs money. And so one of the recommendations that isn't as explicit, but it is in this recommendation, is to be very precise about adding a half a percent or so to a supplemental uh, grant for investigators who want to commercialize and, and protect their intellectual property, but they don't have the resources to do that, and many universities don't. Uh, so that's also captured in, in the first five. Um, again, education in, around intellectual property and cybersecurity is, is really key. The next three recommendations are really pillar two, and that's access to capital. Now, how do we expand the pipeline for growth capital? This is something that really my co-chair Steve Case said. We need more entrepreneurs in more places building more companies. Well, that takes capital. Um, increase those funding opportunities for emerging managers. One of the things that we discovered in our findings is that less than 5% of venture capital goes to African Americans, less than 2% to women, less than 2% to, to Hispanic uh, innovators and entrepreneurs. We're leaving a lot of people behind. Um, finally, can we get some sort of tax credit for people that invest in the R&D in our future. And so that's a recommendation. And then lastly, the two last recommendations are about developing that entrepreneurial talent. And um, you know, I just wanna thank each and every one of you for contributing to this, this excellent report, to the 10 recommendations. And I think we're laying the groundwork for the next 250 years of our country, so thank you. All right, um, thank you to the co-chairs uh, for those remarks. Um, and now, uh, before we dive into the implementation discussion, we vote. Um, so I will call names around the room, um, yay or aye or yes, or however you prefer, uh, if you're in favor, uh, and similarly, uh, nay, no, et cetera, if not. Um, and we'll just start uh, with Byron and go around the table. In favor. Chris. Uh, yes. Michael. Yes. Lisa. Aye. Aziz. Yes. Neil. Yes. David. Yes. Wendy. Yes. Senator. Yes. Rachel. Yes. Yes. Nate. Yes. Was that two yeses? Uh -huh. Bill. Yes. Ryan. Yes. Laura. Aye. Peter. Doug. Yes. And now to those online, Oren? Yes. Patricia? Yes. Amy? Yes. Allie? Yes. Ian? Yes. Christina? Yes. And Steve? No. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be the, okay, I'll change it to yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, well, uh, I think that's a moment to celebrate. So congratulations for formally making this recommendation. Um, I will say that now that you've done that, you've all signed yourselves up for more work. Um, so uh, thank you for that. <laughs> 
Um, let's now, that was a extremely quick uh, vote. Um, so uh, we're a little ahead of schedule, um, which is I think an okay thing. Uh, but I think it's a good time to dive right into discussing kind of what are the types of actions that can go toward implementing that. And I will again hand it over to uh, all our co-chairs um, to lead that discussion. All right, I'll kick it off. Uh, and it builds on some of the comments that were made earlier. I think one way to think of this, particularly on the eve of a Super Bowl, is we're kind of in the red zone. We're we have we, we've made some progress we actually haven't put any points on the board we still have to score to be able to you know kind of you know win the game and i would in my own mind think of this in in two buckets uh the first is recognizing as was said earlier a number of things are already in motion like with the chips and science act you know tech hubs uh, some of the work, you know, ingredients in the Inflation Reduction Act, even some of the things in the bipartisan infrastructure bill. So trying to figure out the ones that most connect to our recommendations, how do we move those forward and maximize the likelihood of them, in the case of tech hubs being fully funded, in the case of all these programs, maximizing the likelihood of being successful. They're already moving, and so uh, it's, a, it's an opportunity that's unique. Most of the time, at least in my experience with these things, there's a bunch of recommendations, and then the process of starting to put them in play happens. In this case, some things already are in play, and so trying to make sure we, we have real you know, momentum, traction, results, uh, success with the things in play is, is one bucket. And then the second bucket, obviously, is the specific recommendations we've made, uh, which we, you know, Pete and team, took a stab at, at you know, yesterday to start this conversation. And this is just the first you know, you know, cut at it. How do you break these recommendations into action items? Which are the things that are on the, you know, the plate for Congress to deal with that only Congress can, you know, can deal with? And you see a number of, of things uh, listed there, things like immigration reform, for example. We can't, you know, just ask for it or, or you know, make it happen without Congress passing uh, action. There are a number of things that uh, the administration needs to take the lead on, including things like establishing the National Innovation Council and, and many of the other initiatives. And there's some things, actually, when we were looking through this, we're a little surprised there were not more that were on the list for the private sector. Mm -hmm. But I think as we have this discussion in the next few few hours, we will add to this list in all three of the buckets and have more clarity in terms of what some of the, the, the action items are. And then the question is really less NACI overall and more of each of us as individuals, what are the specific recommendations that we are most passionate about? And what can we do leveraging our platforms, networks, you know, which we all have in different ways, to try to move those forward? How can we continue to be advocates for the overall report, but in particular focus on one or two things that you really feel are, are critically important? You feel you want to you know, spend some time over the next 6, 12 months, even you know, post you know, serving on, on NACI, to continue to monitor, to continue to you know, push for in you know, whatever way you think is, is, is most appropriate. So some of it is, is just recognizing that there are a number of things that are in place moving and how do we both as a group and individually do what we can to move those forward as, as vigorously and successfully as possible. There's a whole set of recommendations. What, what more can we, what more specificity can we you know, put in place, more meat on the bones, if you will, in terms of extending you know, kind of the, some of the recommendations and making it clear as, a, as, as NACI where we think the responsibility lies for each of those uh, uh, things to happen. And then ultimately, people deciding you know, how much time they're willing to spend over the next year or two years to be an advocate for either overall recommendations or more likely you know, one or two specific recommendations. So that's, I think, in a, you know, the way I would think about it. I've been involved with several of these with uh, NACI in the past and the, you know, the Jobs Council in the past. And you know, I, do, I think what Alejandro said is critically important. There is a tendency in Washington for people to spend a lot of time working on a report and publishing the report and then the report kind of sits on a shelf. And so having a report, which we now have, that has been approved is, is a, you know, a lot of work. And, and as, as we said earlier, appreciate everybody's efforts to contribute to, to get, getting that done. But now we have to put it in motion, and that's really where, what will require our continued engagement, uh, each of us as individuals on the topics that are most, uh, most important in, in your own minds. 
Steve, can I also add, um, I just want to also give um, kudos to Kathy Vidal. Um, uh, through USPTO, the Council on Inclusive Innovation, which was started um, almost two years ago as well, um, also um, uh, echoes some of these recommendations, among them uh, a portal for, for access to um, entrepreneurs, uh, not only looking at um, uh, how to engage, as, as uh, um, uh, Christina mentioned, demographies and geographies, um, how to also engage um, uh, underserved communities or communities that have been um, left out. So the fact that bureaus within commerce are echoing uh, and in parallel what these recommendations are is a validation that we're on the right track. Um, to your point, um, uh, Steve, as well, it's how do we uh, figure out ways to engage the different stakeholders, not only here in Washington, D.C., but also at the state level, uh, engaging the private sector, engaging even philanthropy and, and other, uh, other uh, capital. So um, this is going to be the fun part of this process because not only do we have a great product that was developed with um, tremendous um, thoughtfulness and, and uh, in-depth analysis on so many fronts, but it's now leveraging all of our connections in many ways and the spaces that we present ourselves to, to not only sell this, and I'm using the word very loosely, but more importantly, to make sure that we have buy-in. Um, because it's in the buy-in, as, as Steve is mentioning, that we're going to make either our, our colleagues in, in Congress um, or in the administration or elsewhere to, um, to journey with us and make this all um, uh, a reality. And the country needs it. I can't underscore that enough. Um, we are seeing not only the investments at, at a place-based level, but we also need the investments from a global perspective. And I know that many of you live in that space. Um, so I just don't, well, I want to reiterate that over and over again, that our nation needs it uh, if we are going to continue to be um, that entrepreneurial uh, voice for the next 250 years. Is that what you said, Christina? <laughs> I don't know if we'll be around then, I mean, individually, but as a country, absolutely. Yeah, I would just echo what um, both Steve and, Ala and Alejandra said. Um, I will say we are doing a lot, as Steve mentioned, that we're starting to already implement some of what's in the plan. Um, it, in terms of what we're doing at the USPTO and with Alejandra and across the Department of Commerce, we are leaning in on a national inclusive innovation strategy. So we're hoping to release that by April 26, and that will be a complement to this document. That's going to be about how we bring more people into the system to then, and then this will take over how we make them entrepreneurs and really benefit from that. Another thing that we're doing is that we're going to release a request for comment on commercialization and getting products to market. And so we look forward to people's input on that. That's going to be work that we're all doing together that will support both this initiative as well as the National Inclusive Innovation Strategy. And then beyond that, we have a lot in the works, and I'm really looking forward to brainstorming about how we can work together. Uh, one is we want to be everywhere. So one thing that I've been doing is writing to libraries across the country because right now we do have resources in libraries. Librarians are highly skilled, highly trained individuals who can really uh, push our messages forward. Uh, so right now we have patent and trademark resource centers. I'd like to evolve those so they're really innovation and entrepreneurship resource centers. So you learn not only about um, IP, but also the other skills that you need in order to bring products to market. So I've written recently to 600 libraries across the country. They are signing up quickly. Um, and a lot of them are from uh, diverse areas. They're in HBCUs, they're in MSIs. Uh, and so really excited about that effort. And we're doing a whole rebranding effort that we can all be involved in, including labels on the front door of libraries so you know that that resource is being offered. So I could go on and on about all the work we're doing, but I will say we are doing a lot across government as well. Um, we did a project with NOAA because we want to lean in not just on entrepreneurship and innovation, but in key technology areas such as artificial intelligence, um, such as the climate. And so we did a full study. We had a, an employee exchange. We did a full study of innovation within NOAA. We produced a report and are now following up on that and offering the same services both, we were at the Pentagon recently talking about it, reaching out to go other government agencies on that. And then beyond that, just working
working on how do we support these entrepreneurs to make sure that when they go out and get funding that they're thinking about it, that they're, they're not going to sources that are gonna steal their ideas, that they're not taking on investors that are gonna export the technology, that they're not losing their, uh, what they've created either through the fact that they didn't protect it with IP or through cybersecurity. So we're working with the FBI on that in terms of a cybersecurity light that's not quite the NIST standard that some of the smaller companies can't afford, but is enough to protect the companies and making sure we're rolling out training. So a as we have this discussion, I'm sure I'll mention other initiatives that we have ongoing, but uh, this is stuff that, that Alejandra and I and all of us across DOC have been living and breathing uh, since we stepped foot, not in this building, but in our, in our respective buildings and just look forward to all of your ideas and how we can all work together. That's great. Um, just to follow up on that a little bit, one of the mantras that we've all had, as you know, as we've worked through this, is we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, maybe we just have to make sure the wheel turns a little bit smoother in some cases. And so we are very intentional about including the work on the Council of Inclusive uh, Innovation from uh, Kathy Vidal and her um, team. But I just um, also wanted to say, one of the things that we heard through the pillars in our conversation is that uh, maybe the, the um, government agencies could be more connected. There's a lot of good work going on in silos. What could we do to actually enhance that connectedness? And so hence some of the recommendations, starting with the first one, which is, well, let's get people together as part of a council so that we don't reinvent the wheel, but we actually enhance it and make it m move well. That also led to the, the nine recommendation about networks and then uh, and then even within agencies, um, I've worked very closely when I was Under Secretary of Energy with SBA. Uh, now SBA has the SBIC, it also has SBIR and STTR. Well, you know, how often do those communities get together? How often do they have like Shark Tank kind of uh, opportunities to connect the folks raising the funds with the people that are sh out actually innovating in a regional that could lead to those high growth industries of the future? What we did not do uh, is identify in the moonshot type things, you know, this is our challenge we're gonna take on. We're gonna take on climate. We're gonna take on um, this, that, and the other thing. Because we recognize that there needs to be some fundamental infrastructure developed that can then be activated when we take on these grand challenges. So that was, again, very intentional. Um, I just wanted to, to mention that. I, but I'd love to hear from all of you of what aspects of this particularly resonated with this report. Where would you like to be involved? And where are things that maybe there's going to be a report 2.0 and where we should go? So just to get people chatting. Right. Uh, the first thing that occurs to me in listening to all of you talk is I have the sense now that I've been uh, made an ambassador to take the message about NACI and the recommendations here to the Midwest and the geographies where I work and live. And what would be most useful if it's not already in plan is would be talking points and a PowerPoint deck, right, so that we can be out saying pretty much the same thing all over the country. Yeah, that's a great point. We'll, we'll take that as, as an action item. Um, uh, Michael Crow and I are on a group called um, the uh, Research Alliance. And they recently issued this uh, report, uh, Stack, um, so science technology um, uh, advocacy uh, group, and did exactly what you're talking about, had talking points, and so the social media. Yes, you're right. Each of us needs to be that ambassador, and we'll get the, the tools to you. One other thing that we found that was helpful was to create little mini commercials. So sometimes when I speak, I say, can you play this first? And so we could think about yeah. something like that. And then also little cards that if you speak at conferences, you can tell them to put them on every table with a little QR code. So I think that there's a lot, of, a lot we can do because I think it's going to take much more than those in the room. Like we're the connecting dots that we now need to spread out and get it out everywhere. I'll just say something relative to the use of the phrase uh, not reinventing the wheel. In fact, I think what we've done here, what the group has really put together in this outstanding set of recommendations is how do we get the wheel everywhere? It's the, it's the same process and so forth. So the, 
the U.S. T, uh, you know, Patent and Trademark Office now doing this thing in the libraries is sort of an example of that, you know, and, and an example of that where you could walk into any of these facilities in any community anywhere, you know, Sioux Center, Iowa's library, walk in and you're connected into networks and facilities and mechanisms and tools and assets and so forth because you have this idea. Every college library, not 600, all of them, you know, every, every facility that exists. And so the notion is how do we get the wheel everywhere. When we get the wheel everywhere, this turning then will produce the outcomes that we're looking for, which is highly accelerated innovation outcomes by just sheer numeric flow. Uh, and, and that's what's been missing. Everything, everything in the country has historically been basically pyramided so that it's only accessible to, to small percentages of the population. Uh, and we're trying to break that down, and I think what we have here is a way to do that. Can I make Oh, can I make one comment as well? I, I, I think I worry a little bit when we try to be everywhere, then we're nowhere. And and there are places, I think, particularly given the, these tech hub grants you guys are about to do, that these should be catalysts in those, in those regions. And I think in many ways they have started to become already because they, the universities and the local officials and the governors and the mayors have all gotten together and say, how do we get this money? And then I think once those are awarded, it seems to me it's an opportunity to get the right set of players back together from the private sector, the public sector, the universities, say, okay, how do we now use this as a catalyst to make sure that we're creating a real ecosystem and innovation in this area? And you have organizations. I mean, Steve knows I'm very involved in this region in a group called the Greater Washington Partnership, which the uh, secretary has met with several occasions, you know, you've got, again, I don't know what the, you have a couple Virginia, a couple Maryland, I don't know exactly what will happen, but, you know, this is, you know, biz, business leaders, universities, finance, we've got a little, how, how do we get finance more targeted to where, so I would really think about a strategy to utilize those, those markets, those regions where you're going to make these tech hub awards, because I think that's where you've got, you're going to have this huge influx of investment and ensuring that that is, is um, a spurs the type of inclusive opportunity that ultimately we want, I think is the best near term opportunity. So that's just the comment I'd make. That's great. So piggyback off, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. To piggyback off of what Peter said, I think everyone knows I'm pretty passionate about inclusive capital at this point, so <laughs> um, I'll volunteer for number seven, but I think it also ties into a sort of razor's edge of accountability and recommendations in the financial sector, making sure that that capital is also coming from diverse people, so I'd love to partner with you on that, Peter. And I think it also <coughs> ties into, Kathy, what you're trying to do, because to Christina's point, we don't want to leave any entrepreneur behind, and if you catch them when they're 10 in the library, you'll get them, you know, working at J.P. Morgan and doing a spinoff when they're older. Yeah, and please. just okay. one quick thing, I'm sorry. Uh, I wanted to make sure to welcome uh, Deputy Director uh, of the NEC to the conversation. Um, so please feel free to come and join us. <laughs> Morning. I just want to mention, I, I like Peter's idea of basically following the money, and that's what we've been doing. Uh, we've been doing it with EDA, so when they set up things like tech hubs and, um, and they allocate money, that's where we are. So we're providing direct support to them. So I like figuring out how we do that with all of these offerings. And the other thing is, you know, in terms of like even like the 600 libraries, when I get out and speak, I do a call to action, and people will email me and say, I want to set it up in my library. So I think finding ways to amplify our efforts and giving you the tools to do that where people can just sign up and then they can help with everything that we're doing has been very effective. Just to follow up on that real quick, um, extension offices could be another mm -hmm. opportunity. And if you look at every land grant university in the country, uh, they have an extension office in each county. We had 88 in Ohio, so that might be mm -hmm. another place. Take your idea of the libraries, which is brilliant, and then ex extend it through the offices. Well, one thing I wanted to add was thinking, we're talking about the power of networks in so many of our uh, recommendations. And I agree with Peter on supporting areas where they've won the tech hubs. But I think it would also be valuable to think of all the work that's gone into so many that are also competing to win. And they've built that network and they've invested time and 
money to do that. And if there's a way to create a, you know, it might not be the tech hub win, but the network win, how to support that in, the, in another way to make that valuable and a valuable investment and, you know, leverage the network. I, kind of, I, I completely agree with that. I think where, where you have, I mean, the problem in a lot of these communities is you got everyone working, they're all doing great things, but they're doing it in 20 different directions, and the amount of time it spends, it takes to organize that is just, in my mind, not worth the effort. So where you, I totally agree, where you have communities of different interests who have come together to try to, uh, you know, get one of these grants, even if they didn't get it, trying to provide some continued momentum to that process, uh, I think is, is a terrific idea. Two, two comments. Uh, one is just building on this. We saw a little example this a few years ago when Amazon did its national search for the, their second headquarters, and I think 230 cities applied, uh, and two, then one ended up uh, winning. Uh, and obviously, if you put a lot of time in this and didn't win, you'd be disappointed. But it was interesting to see how the, what happened next, which is some decided, okay, we spent a lot of time and didn't win, and you know, it, the energy and the network sort of dissipated. Others said, well, this was interesting. It actually forced us to think about our strengths, also some of our areas of weakness that needed more attention. It forced us to kind of come together cross sector to be able to you know kind of make the proposal let's continue to fight and continue to build on that and not surprisingly some of the the cities that are now showing momentum and even doing you know well on the tech hub you know selection process are the ones who rather than mm -hmm. quit because they lost the amazon competition viewed that as like the starting gun and said we'll continue to Keep, keep working it in our community and continue to build on our strengths, address some of our weaknesses, extend the, the network, uh, tell our story, and, and, and so forth. So I think that it's, as we think about the implementation, particularly on, on tech hubs, think about chips and science, saying that is an area where continued attention, continued focus uh, it, it can yeah. pay dividends. The other thing I think we should think about, and we should all be thinking about as the day progresses, I like what you said, well, I, I, I want to sign up for number seven. You know, one approach is, it doesn't have to be today, but coming out of this meeting is everybody decide to adopt a recommendation or maybe two recommendations, you know, that they're, they're going to play a particular you know, role in, in a, in a you know, kind of ongoing you know, kind of way. Obviously, all 10 have merit, but if, if each, each of us focused on one or two perhaps, and said, you know, we're going to be kind of focused on that. There might even be some, you know, little continuing discussions, subcommittees, if you will, on each of the 10 where people have at least a few people that they can coordinate with so they don't feel out there on, on their own. So that's something to think about. Is that a good idea to do it? And if, and if so, you know, what one or two would you particularly want to sign up for? That was kind of my comment and, and a question kind of following up on that is, you know, to Neil's point, we're definitely ambassadors to the recommendation as a whole, but there's a lot of work to be done in figuring out the next steps and the details within these recommendations. And last time, Secretary encouraged us to think about low-hanging fruit and early wins. So there's elements in here, the council could be one that could be a very easy early win that we could roll out. Maybe that is a priority that then we can focus on making sure that we understand the steps there, or maybe that's something that EDA will take and will take more of the crafting of things like creating alternate venture capital funding structures that require a lot more definition. So there's definitely a few paths, but we want to make sure that we identify those early wins. Could I just follow up on that? Is that something we could do today is look at the recommendations and the actions within the recommendations and come up with a list of the early wins? Because mm -hmm. we can go after that. I think that would be really crucial. So great suggestion. Um, I was just going to ask a real question. In terms of next steps, um, <clears throat> some of these wins will depend on, as you said, congressional support. What role do you envision for NACI members to help with that push? I, I don't know if that's come up with past councils, but a room full of industry experts, you know, I kind of exclude myself from that, but really there's some people who really know what they're talking about here, and they're not viewed as necessarily part of the executive branch. But you don't want us going rogue either, right? Uh, but a lot of us are in position to talk to our U.S. senators, our congressional members on a regular basis, and can be advocates for that with a very important audience. But, but how do you all see that playing out from a commerce perspective? 
Yeah, I can see that playing out in, in several ways. One is um, information and education with members of Congress as you meet with them, and I'm, I'm sure many of you in, in your respective um, roles. Um, sticking to the, the, the recommendations. And then you can either um, tackle it as NACI, but also send it back to EDA. So for example, if you say, I just met with uh, uh, Senator Carper, uh, the head of EPW, and I just informed him about our NACI recommendations. Let us, let us know, because we can then you know, follow up and be able to talk to the staffers, be able to talk to the member of Congress, expound a bit more on what these recommendations are all about. So that's that's one entry point that we could we could um, consider, uh, because I, I do I do hear you on not going rogue, and um, but I do think that to the extent possible, you all see your members of Congress sometimes in their district, and they're much more willing to listen to you versus being here in Washington D.C. Um, some of you have uh, uh, engagements through your respective institutions. To the extent that you can you know, really weave in these recommendations and, and inform these members of Congress, then let us do some of the, that back-end work um, and continuation, because we, we're, we're in contact with them uh, on a regular basis. And I know Joelle may have an opinion on that as well, but yeah. I can chime in quickly, not to jump the queue, but hello. Thank you for uh, coming together with these great recommendations. Uh, I work on the National Economic Council, mainly on manufacturing supply chain issues. Um, a few things. As you're thinking about early wins, things that are administrative are always, always welcome. That's something we can do early because we can do it ourselves. Um, I know you mentioned the council. I think there was uh, mention of the parameters for the SBIR program in the report. Things like that where, you know, there might exist, already have the, the there might already be the authority for the federal government to act is, is great to identify. And if we know it's a priority and it's administrative, I think that'll help us work with agencies to get things done. Um, and then the second piece I would just echo um, what Alejandra was saying, you all are, are very important advocates. You have networks and you have credibility in a space where the federal government, you know, for all the things where we may be credible, we, we, we may not. And so um, the places where you can be really, really helpful is amplifying the importance of, of the recommendations you're making, but also, um, you know, talking to members of Congress and also continuing to identify places where the funding we do have can be helpful. So I know we were mostly talking about the uh, ecosystem at large, but I would encourage folks to think about places in the clean energy space where we might be able to be creative with the existing funding authorities we have. The Department of Energy is giving out a lot of grants and loans right now, and I imagine that that would be a really helpful conversation for you all to have with some of the leaders in, in that agency as well. If I could just uh, double click on a comment that, um, uh, uh, that Chairman Case made. Um, uh, specifically when you were talking about the Amazon um, uh, process. Um, what I, my, my community, Houston, Texas, um, uh, uh, really did a lot of introspective thinking after that. And part of the reason why I thought that was such a big deal was because they came out with some very clear criteria in terms of what they were looking for. And then they you know, unwittingly created like a ranking um, because they first said that, hey, we've now come down to like this number of cities in terms of finalists. And then they were like, oh, and now we've got like, you know, final finalists. And like, you know, they kind of went down like a stage path where cities could actually see and in communities could actually see where they were on kind of a stack ranking. I bring this up because um, as we now think about the implementation process for our recommendations, um, we're going to have individual checkpoints with communities in terms of the awards of grants um, and hubs and criteria. But but the narrative shouldn't be that, hey, these are winners and these are losers. Instead, I feel like the narrative really needs to focus on the fact that this is a journey that all of our communities are going down against these ideals in terms of what makes that flywheel for innovation work. And so part of the messaging as we roll out should be very focused on, hey, like here's where we're seeing lots of improvement and here's where we're seeing lots of opportunity and let's just make sure that we can help these communities kind of focus on their opportunities in light of the recommendations on a very regular basis. Because if we, if we have that type of a narrative, then I think that we can recreate what's going on in the cities that responded very positively to that Amazon piece, which is, like at least like where I live in Houston, we now revisit where we would have ranked on a pretty regular basis to kind of see how we're doing. And I think that could be very powerful for communities moving forward. Um, just changing gears a little bit, uh, as, I think, <clears throat> as I think I've said before, uh, I represent an ecosystem that is not gonna be getting any money, um, is not gonna be a place for a new tech hub, but I do think there's a real opportunity 
to tap into the VC community that has been so robust, you know, in the Cambridge area. That's that's where I hang out, and I'd be interested in a, a thought partnership to think about how to tap in to that community because, in fact, they think all the time and talk a lot of talk all the time about how to be more inclusive. And the problem is they don't like look past you know Harvard and MIT and you know. You know, we understand the challenge, but I really sense that there's a, an opportunity to try and um, take advantage of people who actually know a lot, who are willing to teach and educate, and really, and all the LPs are now asking them, right? They're asking them to be more and do more. And so I think, I think there's an opportunity there. I don't exactly know the answer, but I'm interested in anyone who wants to I raise my hand to be a to be a thought partner in that. And the other thing I was just going to say is that there's a an interesting program, at least one that I'm aware of, in the area that is focused on entrepreneurship in middle school and and in high school. And the goal is to actually take kids who have lots of challenges and for whom the regular education system hasn't worked so well, mm -hmm. and say, you know what, this is a thing. It's a different skill. Let's see if you have this skill. And I think it's a beautiful idea. And I think it's something that really can be perpetuated a, a little bit more broadly. And, and, and it can happen anywhere. Because you know, when you're talking about middle school, you're talking about selling cookies or cleaning kicks. Or you know, it, they're simple ideas. But it's the idea of how you can be successful as an entrepreneur when you're not a straight A student. And so I, I think there's something there for us to maybe tap into also. I think to amplify to amplify those that message, we live in the same city, and I'm the co-founder of the only minority-funded VC firm in Boston, and we haven't been invited into those conversations. It has to come from the government. <laughs> yep, I just wanted uh, uh, Byron O'Geese from Opportunity at Work. I wanted to. There's a, there's a common theme in this report that I think is really, really powerful, and I, I think we should say it explicitly. It's that it's not just certain kinds of people who can be entrepreneurs or certain places that produce entrepreneurship, that the, 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 the propensity and the desire is sort of, not everyone wants to be an entrepreneur, but that's spread like throughout society in sort of every community and every place, and that when we talk about the, the, the wheel or this ecosystem, it's not, it's not the, 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 the people that are there, it's the way the system works together and the access and the exposure and the mentorship and the connection, and it is greater than the sum of the parts. So I think there's a couple of real implications for this as we think about implementing and as we think about what constitutes low-hanging fruit. Um, first of all, and I, I relate what you said, Aziz, which is that uh, there's progress to be made everywhere in putting this together. Um, Kathy, I love the libraries idea just because that's a platform that's accessible in you know most every community. And I think there'll be a lot of ideas like that to continue to think about horizontally, how do we make sure whether you, you're winning you know, a Tech Hub award or, or not, that, you are, um, that you're still getting this access, you're still getting that spark, because we're going to see so much more entrepreneurship, and then you know, five years from now, places that maybe don't look like they're on the verge will look like they're on the verge, because the raw material is there. And I, we, we, we've, we've kind of said that in the report, but I think it's really important to reinforce that, because there's a widespread belief um, and it has a lot of implications that it's some people in some places that are entrepreneurial or innovative and others are not. And we don't believe that and we need to make sure that that's understood. So that's one thing, the broad. But then in the places, I, I'm a big advocate for, uh, for the places that are getting awards where there is this new investment for really uh, emphasizing and focusing there because you can get a lot more done, as Peter said. However, there's a, a second implication is related to a couple of the last comments. Uh, even in those places, these networks work very well, but they're very limited relative to the community as a whole. So when we think about what should come out of, of a Tech Hub grant or any of these things, it really is also systematically tapping into a much wider swath of those communities. And there, I think, there actually is low-hanging fruit that's often not perceived as that. There are 70 million Americans who 
don't have bachelor's degrees, but they're skilled through alternative routes. They're working, they've got skills, and if you look very closely at the skills they have, they're very proximate to the skills that are needed to move into many of these areas, either in support of entrepreneurial ventures or indeed as entrepreneurs themselves. And so I think from the standpoint of ensuring that that's visible, that the data is there, that the connective tissue is there, and we even talked about this, and that was part of the, the recommendations with the tech hubs, the spin uh, recommendations about these, these skilled pathways. So I, I, just, I just think, uh, we, 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 we need to make sure we don't fall back on a notion of low-hanging fruit as just same old, same old, but rather um, expanding and really, really strengthening both horizontally and, and in those places that are intensely working on this. I think We've got uh, Oren on the online. Oren? Yeah, um, thanks everyone. Uh, I just wanted to say congratulations to everyone. This is an ex extraordinary report. It really came together in a way that I think it was hard to imagine when we started this process. Um, I just wanted to echo what Rachel said. In New York City, it's I think a lot of the initiatives coming out from federal government, um, I'm incredibly excited about, many of my peers are, um, but it's something that we could do more to bring, to leverage the ecosystems that are unlikely to get money directly, but want to offer their help and assistance on behalf of the country, to bring them into the tent. And so Rachel, if you're interested, and I think um, Lisa and others, if there's kind of a existing startup hub subcommittee of how do we activate our ecosystems to get behind this and get excited about it? Um, what do we do with our local representatives who aren't going to be getting, you know, this kind of money, um, but still want to be supportive and want to be part of it? I know some of it's like we we're uh, for the NSF. We're a mentor. We're one of the mentor institutions for SUNY Binghamton, which um, which did win one of their, um, you know, the art programs and the innovation uh, and the regional innovation engines. But there's opportunities to do some stuff within state, but also to be part of the national fabric. And we'd love to do that. So if a subcommittee could be formed, I think you'd have quite a few enthusiastic uh, people here as well. Yeah, I, I, I sorry, no, sorry, the second point I forgot is um, some of us are embedded in universities um, and so and are part of the cross university network as well. I know Ian McClure on the phone was obviously the president of Autumn and many of us are going to be at Autumn, our annual meeting next week in San Diego. And so if there's an opportunity to wave this around a little bit and brag, but also get more universities engaged um, on the tech transfer, innovation, entrepreneurship, commercialization side, you know, Ian and I can put our heads together. It'd be great to get some help from commerce um, on like, what should we be telling our peer institutions about where they can plug in? So can I, can I just make, I, I, I think this is a great conversation. I do think as you announce the awards, being able to uh, emphasize what are some of the common characteristics of collaborations not that that we saw across the award winners and also emphasize while everyone doesn't get a participation award just for applying we saw a lot of these common characteristics in communities that didn't get awards but still we see the seeds of the type of you know investment and partnership that can ultimately succeed and attract investment in those communities. So I think being able to have us talk about, it's not just, you know, you chose X city or Y city, but what were the things that we saw? And I think going back to the Houston point for the, there will be communities that just say, okay, we're giving up and like that's, it is what it is. But it, to the extent there are communities say, we want to stay in the game and we want to understand how we get better. I think to the extent you guys can reinforce, this is what we saw across a lot, a, a number of communities, whether they, received awards or didn't receive awards and just encouraging everyone to stay in the game. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I just wanted a couple of things. Um, so much great conversation. Um, uh, Oren, I, um, I, I would like to definitely talk to you and, and Ian, particularly as you go to Autumn, because again, to be ambassadors of this, of this report is going to be very important. And Autumn is a fantastic um, uh, network that we uh, need to better tap into. Um, so happy to, to uh, connect with you before you head out to, to San Diego, just to give you as much um, resources as possible. Um, and as was mentioned, talking points and any other materials to just lift this up. Um, uh, Peter, uh, both you as Ease and, uh, and Steve and others have mentioned, what are the lessons learned? You know, the Build Back Better regional challenge, which we don't mention as much anymore, because Tech Hub has probably taken, taken the, the lead role now, uh, was uh, a prelude uh, to Tech Hubs in many ways. We, we had incredible lessons learned, particularly at the coalition level. Um, and I think 
the fact that we also made all of that information public gave folks an opportunity to look at what successful coalitions look like, mm -hmm. who was at the table, who was missing at the table, what were the elements, what, um, uh, what, what was integrated into the proposal. So more to come on that, but you're absolutely right. Um, making that more, much more publicly known is, is important. The other thing I would say is, you know, at the end of the month, <clears throat> we have the National Governors Association. I mentioned the governors because um, some governors have been truly instrumental in joining in and supporting both successful coalitions and non-successful coalition. It hasn't worked in every state. I grant you that. Um, but the, the governors do have a very important role to play. And I'm seeing how both governors, state legislatures are um, uh, really journeying together by either um, providing more technical assistance, more guidance, convening as well as um, putting in some additional dollars. So there is a lot of takeaway in these, at least from the EDA experience, that we can, we should be pushing out more to the general public, particularly um, as well as our communities of practice, which have been you know, garnering a lot of additional information. This is the model, I think, uh, as we go into the future. Again, not government telling you exactly what to do, but giving you the framework so that coalitions can actually um, be the architects of their economic future. Yeah. I, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Just a, a couple of observations from ground, the ground game, and also from just hearing the conversation across this particular group. And uh, it's, it's quite an honor, and it's also um, really put some spike, if you will, and to what I think some of our next steps sh could be. Um, I want to talk about leverage, though. That's what we have now. Leverage, real leverage at the national level through all the agencies and all the things folks are doing to support industrial policy, the new industrial policies, but also in a state. I mean, the alignment that this effort has created, I mean, recompete, I mean, tech hubs, I mean, build back, all of that. It's like all of a sudden, folks are awake, right? And perhaps that even started back in the Amazon uh, phase of looking for a city too. But I see, hear, and sense clear momentum from the leverage that's being provided through opportunities um, like Tech Hub and Recompete and, all, and NSF, I want to come to that. And I think it's our job to take those conditions to the next step. My biggest fear is what we've heard is that, okay, it's a lot of work to do this. This is real time, always on work to pursue any of these grants. So the last thing we want is for everyone to flop and be sad. But we talked about in the early days of Tech Hubs, we talked about that. What about the communities that don't win? What are we going to do there? We give, give them money? No, we probably won't. But have we set those expectations? So I'm excited about the leverage that's driven momentum and conditions. Let's think about the commonality between engines, the NSF engines, and tech hubs, and Recompete, and others. All place-based, really important. So that language now has really become a thing. I know EDA, you guys talk about that and have for a long time, but for states who are swirling around trying to do whatever they can to bring economic vitality uh, to their states, you know, that didn't resonate as much as it has now. Number one, place-based. Number two, national and economic security, that's part of the language now. Not just in Colorado, but I see that when I wander around the U.S. and do the work that I do. It's, it's a consistent theme. And there are 10 technologies, at least, that the national, you know, the federal government has said these matter. You get that language going, that will spur innovation and entrepreneurship. So that's the second thing. And the third thing is inclusive workforce. I mean, how can you have a tech hub and not build a talent pipeline. It seems obvious now, but trust me, back in the day, it wasn't probably as obvious as it is now. So place-based national economic security and building the workforce of the future, not just more PhDs, but 
everyone that needs to be part of building out whatever technology ecosystem you're building, that's, that narrative is solid. Now, PowerPoints are good. You can give me one. I'll be sure to use it. But I do think that the narrative is clear as a bell. And I think it's our job to play that out with those, anyone that's applied. And then the last thing I would say is, you know, the EDA designation, which gave some of the, of the regions a chance to then apply for real money, I think we need to reinforce what that designation means. Like, I really do, because people don't really think about that, because now they're all obsessed with 70 million or whatever the number is. There were real benefits with being a designation. You're not taking the designation back. There's leverage in the system. I would say to all those 300 who were designated, what are you doing? To leverage those tools, those programs that were very explicitly stated, even as you're pursuing, because if they can think about that, if they don't get any money, which they may not, they can have that working for them, that part of the momentum, which most states aren't doing because it's just so much. So that's my two cents, and I would love to be a part of any committee that's driving this across the U.S., the narrative, the learnings, and the observations so we can get the governors involved, the state legislators involved, and then, of course, the federal delegation from each of these states, because I think that's the turn of the crank that would really make a difference across the U.S. I'll volunteer for that, too, because we all know I make the best pitch decks. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I wanted to build on what Steve was saying about people picking one or two of the, um, of the ideas, because it seems like a lot of what we're talking about is where we're going to intersect, whether it's going to be with Congress, whether it's going to be in the schools, whether it's going to be with the tech hubs. And it seems that it might be good to do more of a matrix where not only you're picking that, but we know who's leaning in with the ledge, who's leaning in with schools, because a lot of these recommendations, we don't want to go to the schools twice or, or more than that. We want to figure out what is our ask of the schools, what is our ask of the legislature. And so um, I would suggest we do that as well. And then if somebody's interfacing with the legislature, they could report into that group. So we can all do the work, but at least somebody's controlling it and making sure that we are leveraging and we are getting the most out of it. Um, so I just wanted to add that. Doug, did you? Sure. Um, so as you talk about uh, you know, how, to, how to best do this ecosystem acceleration, one thing I think maybe seeing the obvious is we have to figure out how to get the private sector more involved. Mm -hmm. And uh, to Neil's point, you know, having a, a playbook for business, basically for corporate and philanthropic engagement of the innovation ecosystem, I think is going to be critical. Because um, there are some places, like, like Peter points out, with the, you know, these various business councils that actually are effective in these kinds of efforts. But so many more aren't, right? Most chambers of commerce are maybe the largest uh, employers, the smallest uh, Main Street businesses, and almost nothing in between. And, you know, most models of corporate innovation tend to be, you know, a lot of, uh, well, I won't say what, but uh, uh, at best corporate VC, maybe. And so I think, you know, at, with the unique purview that commerce has and EDA has of, of how these hubs actually are being empowered by their local uh, ecosystems, uh, and particularly, again, the, the, the private and philanthropic sectors, I think it would be really important for us to try to elevate. Because, again, I think we're, we're I'm coming from a state where, again, we, we did not sort of succeed in a lot of the awards, and um, and part of this is uh, we have a business community that really has not been about community in that same way, um, which I think has been, uh, it's, it's, it's going to take a long time for us to get, because any strategic change has to be preceded, I think, by cultural change. Can I add to that, actually, um, on both of your comments, Kathy and, and Doug? I think we should also consider looking at this by stakeholder, because if you are a minority, entrepreneur, what are the tools that we're putting together here that would be relevant to you? And then figure out where are the tools, how do we supply those tools? Is it a library? Is it you know, any other local network, et cetera? So thinking about the stakeholder and how are we surrounding them with the tools that we're gonna develop here and then offer all those tools at once, at once in a way that is cohesive and, 
and kind of put together, right? Because I think if we if we go off and you're developing the VC thing and you're doing the, then we are going to be a little bit more sporadic in terms of how do the stakeholders find those tools and probably less effective. So something to consider. And they're lumped. Like you can't have seven without six, seven, eight, and nine. <laughs> you know. Yeah, uh, hi, great conversation. I, maybe I'll tee off of the connection to corporate and, you know, I have a long background in, in kind of being a, an entrepreneur as, you know, which w when you're in large corporate America, that tends to not be well supported. So I think when we think about our recommendation reports connection to industry, to think about translating the entrepreneurship term to entrepreneurship and how do we engage and, and, and the whole thing about, you know, supporting every types of, uh, you know, corporates are in, all, all different geographies, they all have demographies, or just like everyone does, right? And how do we utilize our work to synergize that? And, and when you get back to government funded R&D, make it connected in a way that, you know, like, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, you know, you can leave your company and get an SBR grant, but you can't get a grant to try to do something new in your company. And I have to say the back pressures on companies today are predominantly quarter by quarter. You know, I'm looking at the short term, it's getting less and less longer term focused. So we don't think about that huge capacity. As we all know, more R&D still happens in industry than it does outside of industry. But how do we capitalize on that connectivity in a powerful way that, that doesn't always think like you have to be a small business to be an entrepreneur? You know, I think that's, that, that mentality I think is dangerous and destructive, honestly, to overall what we're trying to accomplish here. So I think we've got about 15 minutes left in this part of the discussion. And in the next part, after the break, um, we're going to focus more on what you're going to do, um, the adopt a recommendation part uh, of, this, of this day. Um, so I think in these next 15 minutes, one thing that might be a good uh, catalyst for you all to think about during the break as we caffeinate, et cetera, um, are some of the seeds of some of these ideas. Um, as you all were working on developing this, um, these ideas didn't come out of thin air. They came from something that you experienced in your ecosystem, some program you saw work, some problem you personally experienced. Um, so I'd love to put that out as a prompt, uh, to have some of you share really what, what was the kernel of what led to this um, as a way to uh, lead off into the conversation of, of where you all might continue this work uh, after today. I'll, I'll speak to that a little bit. For me, um, partly informed by my work with climate entrepreneurs uh, who didn't fit a lot of conventional models for financing their work, um, and, and more recently, focused on learning more and more about how many different types of people are marginalized by our current systems and um, you know, looking for opportunities to not <coughs> force people to fit into our systems, but to really develop and, and build tools and structures and systems that work for all people. And um, so for me, that's the seed. And I, you know, I, Senator just made the comment about you can't do six or seven without eight and nine, and like th these these are obviously very interconnected. And for me, the theme that runs through a lot of these is 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 what do we need to do differently? Not just get more people to fit into the VC model, for example, but how do we create other financing models, alternatives to um, those financial structures that that are embracing um, folks that have different values um, that 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 don't put shareholder profits first, for example, or that prioritize the climate outcomes over the financial outcomes. And I think um, one of the key players and partners in this, and I think Doug mentioned philanthropy, but I think, f you know, when we talk about the private sector, you know, I think of the corporate sector very different than the philanthropic sec se sector, and I think that those, we should draw a distinction, and I think philanthropy can be a key player um, in supporting some of these models and, and actually putting dollars into funds in the way that the federal government may not be able to um, uh, and, and grant dollars to support some of these organizations as well. So that's, um, for me, a theme is really trying to um, center um, mm -hmm. communities that have not been part of this innovation uh, economy historically. Um, and I think we often think of marginalized uh, communities and the financing they need as being more microfinance and Main Street business kind of finance. Um, and then we treat uh, innovation as something very different. And there's a whole spectrum 
um, of participation in the innovation economy that I think really is, is, is been overlooked. No, I, I think that was excellent, and I hope someone recorded that, because we had a lot of conversation about uh, that tension between you know, you've got the VC mainly backing certain demographies and geographies, you know, 66% around the coast, et cetera, et cetera. How do, are, do you change that, or do you provide more opportunity to take advantage of that to communities that have not previously done that? And that's what we're trying to bring out in the report. So I love that. I uh, absolutely think that's right. The other thing to keep in mind is that 50%, someone, uh, Bob Kahn actually shared that he used to head the uh, Gavali, um Foundation. He said 50% of the R&D at, at, uh, is philanthropically funded. And, and I don't know if it's at nonprofits, it was just universities, I think it was just the universities, but that's a lot. So to your point, uh, absolutely, thank you. Um, and I think Allie, uh, if you wanna chime in. Sure, hi everyone, sorry I couldn't be there today. Um, I wanted to double click on what David just said, um, my experience working closely with entrepreneurs, working in climate, working in economic mobility, bumping up again and again and again against the limitations of sort of the growth at all costs model. And so that's part of what inspired me to have a really active voice in uh, the part of the recommendations that was talking about expanding the definition of venture capital and looking at alternative financing mechanisms. And I've also been thinking about Lisa's comment to mapping the stakeholder journey and who are the stakeholders that are not in the room? How do we use this next phase of the work to invite in voices that are not represented currently on the Zoom squares or at the table um, to help us bring these recommendations forward? I'm thinking about the National Innovation Accelerator Network. How do we bring in the voices of amazing entrepreneur support organization leaders from black and brown communities, the Black Innovation Alliance, for example, um, into the conversation as we start to think about those first quick wins. Thank you. Eric, could I chime in? Um, just to, to echo, I think, what, what David and Ali said, I think it's going to be very important as we put these recommendations out into the world to really think about the places that aren't currently touched by our idea of entrepreneurship and, um, you know, building the, you know, the, the, the innovation and the big companies and sort of the historical definitions. I think we have a new generation of entrepreneurs that are much more mission driven, maybe looking at new models, new approaches. I think, you know, one uh, very obvious example, I mean, coming from the, spending a lot of time in the nonprofit space, um, looking at, uh, you know, one very obvious current example, of course, is something like OpenAI, right, which is, you know, has this very interesting, nonprofit and um, model and yet is driving, you know, immense innovation in the AI space. So I think really thinking through where we can touch and, and so related to that, I, I was going to recommend it'd be interesting to look at the, the recommendations and, and really think about where each slice of it, how you, you've sort of broken down some of these action items between Congress, the administration, and the private sector, but also even more granularly of, of where within our communities, um, and I think Lisa said, you know, mentioned this earlier, you know, what, what pieces could go where to reach, you know, what things are applicable within the university space, what things are applicable, um, you know, within our accelerators and co-working facilities and things like this that, you know, I think really being granular to try to try to reach some more areas. And then the other question I was going to ask, is there a, a thought to, you know, we can be ambassadors individually, but what about looking into communities and having some of the networks and organizations and associations or spaces, you know, almost become NACI affiliated or EDA affiliated? And, uh, you know, I know that, that there's been done in a way with the challenges before, but almost to sort of say to like pick up the flag and kind of help run with this. If, and I don't know if any thoughts been given to that sort of the sort of, um, you know, come like a you know, I don't know, like an affiliate or an ambassador level, like where they, you know, kind of become a voice within their local communities. I just want to build on your comment on uh, AI, particularly open AI, because it gets to this issue of uh, capital in different forms beyond current venture capital. But one of the challenges that I'm worried about, and we've addressed it, but this is where maybe some follow-up would be helpful, is if we 
frame it as, as I said at the beginning, America winning this next battle, the technology of the future, industry of the future. Most of those battles, whether it be AI, synthetic biology, climate, what's different versus maybe 25 years ago is they're very significant investments to get on the playing field. Mm -hmm. Hundreds yeah. of millions of dollars, billions of dollars, even OpenAI, which started, as you said, as a nonprofit, decided to create a for-profit because they concluded they would not be successful unless they had a model to access tens of billions of capital. And uh, you know, obviously created some dynamics that they're still trying to fully understand. But if America is going to lead in these technologies, it's going to require significant investment. Mm -hmm. And right now, there's a risk that that significant investment will come from big tech getting bigger. And the stock increases in their valuation in the last few years suggest that that is how most people think it will work. So the question is, in AI, for example, how do we make sure that it is open and is more dispersed? And that argues for things like open source versions of AI and even some of the existing AI platforms, including open AI, actually isn't really open. And so how do you make sure some of these platforms, even if they're funded by large companies or new companies that are able to aggregate significant capital, as part of that from a policy standpoint are open, uh, and, and so smaller companies, younger companies uh, with less access to capital can play, and it's not just you know, big tech you know, getting bigger. So that's part of this, this issue of, of it's in, in these biggest industries that are likely, if you define it as the United States versus China, for example, it, it is not you know, kind of a dorm room startup writing an app and dropping in the app store. It's very significant, you know, capital, you know, required. Uh, and, 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 and of course, the largest companies are going to have that capital and have an advantage, and we want them to participate. But how do we make sure their efforts don't limit, you know, kind of the disruptors kind of coming from, uh, from, uh, from the edges, and what are other models that allow significant capital to be aggregated around these core technologies and, and core industries so we can, as a nation, play to win uh, and do it partly by making sure there's significant funding of some of the core platform technologies, but also they are open or at least open enough to allow you know thousands of flowers to bloom, more people in, in more places. That's yeah. I think one of the inherent tensions as we move into this, in the, in, into this in this next world. And as, as you said, which is why I wanted to build on your point, uh, the open AI evolution from a nonprofit to essentially a for-profit, even though there's some you know some uh, still nonprofit that technically controls it, was essentially a conclusion they would be irrelevant unless they had a path to access significant capital, which required creating a for-profit. Can I just Let me just add a point to Steve's point, if I might, just that exact point. So, so Google, one of these companies, or Alphabet, you know, whoever, however you want to call them. So Ben Gomes was visiting our campus just the other day. We have a major project with them uh, through YouTube with investment and all kinds of other things. And this was our exact conversation. I said, you guys are basically the death star you know, you, 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 you consume everything, you, you overwhelm everything. And, and I could tell in these conversations with him, and this is my third conversation with him, he has no idea what I'm talking about. He's been very successful when he ran Google Search, and now he's running Google Learn. You know, very successful uh, brain and all kinds of other, he has, what we're talking about in this room, he has no idea. So, so we think of Google as this unbelievably innovative firm. It is unbelievably capable. It is, it is, it is. If we could find a way to educate the leadership of these firms as a part of all of this also, it would be very, very powerful. Because they're actually producing net negative outcomes uh, in their Death Star modality, meaning they just suck everything into their orbit, into their gravity. It becomes consumed by them or crushed by them. And so I'm overgeneralizing, but, but it, it, was a, it was a point of the conversation. Sorry to interrupt. But. Yeah, can I, um, I just want to build on that, because I'm heading to UAE on Friday to deal with that very issue, and I just spoke yesterday to Microsoft, Google, and a number of companies about that very issue on AI and how we're going to make sure that people have access, because the startups, they say, I need data and I need the machines. Yeah. 
Yeah. Like I need the technology and I need the data. So we're working with them. So just if anybody's at the intersection of that, please connect with me because the secretary is leading AI across US government and we're leaning in hard and fast on it, including the work I'm doing in UAE across governments um, this weekend and into next week. So I agree that that's essential. If anybody wants to connect on that, please contact me. You know, I think one of the things just to focus uh, on your comments and, and Michael's, when I talk to our researchers on AI, they say, we need the machines at $2.5 per GPU per hour, and you need 10,000 of these. We can't afford the time, we can't get access, and so I think there needs to be an initiative where we put these resources in the in the not-for-profit sector so that people can get access to it, so they can look at climate change problems, they can look at other problems that are that are not uh, for-profit in, in all. Yeah, I, and we're working with NSF on that, by the way. Right. So that's another project that's we have right. ongoing. Yeah, it's, it's an incredibly important point. We've talked less about it maybe in, in this report, but the, there is something about just in terms of that way the industry structure evolves. There's going to be massive scale utilities. There, there has to be just the economics of some of these things. And so the question is, is what are going to be the interfaces to those utilities? What is going to be the access? Because there can be massive entrepreneurial systems like built on top of them. In fact, even big companies depend on them. And I think an analogy that is worth kind of thinking about is how for example, the Human Genome Project evolved I mean, because there were there were private efforts, there were public efforts. But if there if the if the Human Genome Project had not evolved in a way that there was a right a world class data set that was open and that therefore um, both large companies and entrepreneurial companies could build on top of it, could test with it, could and it was a huge it's been a huge source of innovation and it's still going to be. At the same time, if, if 20 companies had tried to build the underlying data set, that would never have worked. So thinking about what, where exactly the slicing goes, and there's a lot of policy that goes into it early to, to get that outcome, but um, it's not predetermined that just because these utilities need to be massive and very expensive and some mix of big companies, big universities, big you know government investments, that doesn't mean we have to have a structure that can't have a tremendous amount of open innovation on top of it. And we just really need to make sure that's true in some of these areas. Doug, were you going to jump in? Yeah, uh, just going going back to an earlier point on what, where the some, maybe the biggest gap in, in in these recommendations actually landing in implementation, I think, is 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 really around the, the gap of belief. I think that the, the th these are all good things to do. Is that we're, we're writing a better story, uh, hopefully for the for the for the country, but in so many places, again, the, the, it's this is like alien, right? Uh, foreign. Um, and so what I reflect on is that, you know, almost every startup working sort of startup ecosystem has a certain number of relatable heroes, right? Folks that are actually identifiable in some way that people can sort of see, right? There's footsteps to follow, and, uh, but there's a, there's a belief that this is possible. And so again, I, I think as we, you know, round this up, one of the things I, I, I again, maybe this is like the, the uh, CEO and me, but I sort of like think about the, the marketing challenge of how we deliver this product. Um, but again, I think there's a, uh, um, at least in our community, like you know, we, we're operating out of Detroit, where again, there's sort of um, if a declining, you know, personal income right for the last ten years, and uh, we we started things like Black Tech Saturdays, which is you know now spread it to over to Baltimore and so forth, highlighting some of our you know black entrepreneurs in AI, advanced manufacturing, life sciences, clean tech, and so forth, but without that sort of concerted effort in a community that's you know not being sort of honored, reflected that way, it's, it's very hard for folks to believe that any of this is actually possible. So anyway, I just want to call it that I think, you know, this is going to be the biggest challenge of, of, of this work. You know, actually, we have these strategic goals that many of us are aligned to, but broader communities, you know, it's, it's very difficult for them to see or feel that this is actually possible. And so we, we have to figure out how to get over that. Let's do, uh, let's jump to Lisa and then Senefer, and then we, you are all do a break. Um, so uh, I'll give a little bit of administrative comments and then we'll, we'll take a little break. But Lisa. Thank you. Um, so I just want to underline, triple underline <laughs> what uh, Steve has said and Christina and Michael. When we were talking in the NEAN committee or in the Moonshot committee, we were talking about NEAN and the networks. Uh, one of the things that we kept bumping upon was the fact that a lot of these industries of the future require a lot of money, right? They require a lot of money to scale. It is inefficient and frankly impossible to think that the venture capital community can fund this widely at the level that we need to get the pace that we need for us to have the, the future 
uh, uh, dominance, if you want to call it that, uh, in terms of entrepreneurship. And so we continuously came back to the idea and the thought that you do need some sort of scale facility or some sort of shared resource that can be used by more of one, actually hundreds, if not dozens, of companies in different areas of the United States. For example, we talked very in a lot of detail about climate, particularly food. A lot of synthetic biology, cultivated meat, et cetera, require a lot of very extensive scale equipment. Why don't we come up with some kind of facility that many entrepreneurs can use and ergo not necessarily need such large checks at the most important areas of their growth, right? Because we know that venture capital is naturally not great at necessarily only identifying the best opportunity, but the most uh, comfortable and uh, similar uh, entrepreneurs. And so I think that we really need to consider the thought of if we want to advance in the industries of the future, we need to identify what are the areas that entrepreneurs require a ton of money or a ton of resources to do. And Kathy, you mentioned, for example, AI. Um, And how do we potentially think about nonprofits and scale equipment so we can share those resources and move those folks further quicker. As an example, in that same space, we just put together a $300 million package with $200 million, $270 million coming from one company to build a community incubator for semiconductor development, which is accessible to anyone with any idea that has the opportunity to to be there and and do that. So that that company thought there was uh, sufficient advantage to them by learning of new ideas from entrepreneurs using a commonly available space that we would make available in a massive uh, clean room facility that we have 40,000 square feet of class 10 clean room. Uh, and then that's, that's a community center. And so it's that kind of example in these newer areas like synthetic food and microelectronics. If you don't have those facilities, there's no way for the idea generator to move forward. All right, Senator, the last word of the morning. It's <laughs> a lot of pressure. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think to echo on what David said and to tie in what everyone's saying, as we go into the implementation portion, I would encourage everyone from government to capital to banking to everywhere else to think differently about how to implement. Venture capital especially has shown us this year this money won't reach the people that we want it to reach. And so we have to implement differently. And so I've heard us sort of fall back on our lived experience a lot in this conversation, and I'm grateful to you, David, for blowing that up a little bit. Um, But I think we have to think about something completely different to be able to get this money out because it's shown us that it's not flexible enough to do it. And I think looking around this room has been a great example. If you look around this room right now, none of the women or people of color would be able to build that. And I want you to take that home because that's the industry that's deploying the money now. And it's not, I'm not being dramatic, it went from 2% down to 1.7% in 2023. And so we have to not rely on that in order to be able to implement this equitably. All right, Uh, thank you all for the robust discussion. I will keep this brief. Uh, If you need Wi-Fi or if you need uh, something other than the coffee that is out there, uh, please find one of the staff, Misha, Pete, Lakshmi, Amanda, uh, et cetera. Uh, They can show you the way. Uh, So Wi-Fi or things that are not uh, coffee to consume, Uh, although please don't bring them into this room. Um, And we will be back here at 1115. Um, So we will see you shortly. While you are getting coffee or whatever, uh, please think about which of these recommendations you want to adopt. Um, The next 45 minutes or so, uh, we will be talking about what you all are going to commit to do next um, to help pursue these. Thanks. I think we are all back. Um, Thank you all for, again, for the robust conversation this morning. Um, I think that was a good way of framing up this next conversation, which is, what are you all going to do now? Um, And what I'd like to do, uh, I know that there were some folks who had some ideas already about how to take action on a few of these recommendations. Um, So I I may call on a name to start things off, um, but would like to at least get one person who's um, committing to lead on forming some concrete actions around each of the 10 recommendations. Um, So just because I was talking to her in the hallway and she had some concrete ideas, 
on how we might spread capital um, and expertise around that throughout the country. Let me call on Rachel to kick it off. Um, so just following up on what we were talking about a little bit earlier, and I'm going to double down on the argument that there's you know, lots of places where there's you know, people who know things and are willing to teach those things, even if they're not in places that are going to receive money. And so I will personally volunteer um, both as a human teacher, but as well as someone who is going to try and galvanize a community of people to you know, be part of the solution in terms of educating entrepreneurs. And I recognize that the point that has been made many times here, which is that it looks different. Entrepreneurship looks different in different places, and I, and I certainly get that. And um, although I think about biotech, um, it, I also have some exposure to, as I mentioned, you know, sort of highly low-tech entrepreneurial ideas and people who are interested. And so I will raise my hand to figure out how to connect that ecosystem as well as, you know, sort of offer up my own services. And anyone, Oren, who wants to be a thought partner in that, you know, I would welcome. Um, and I think this seems perhaps related to some of the first five um, of these uh, recommendations, but um, do you have a specific one that you think it aligns with? Everything's related to everything. So, um, <laughs> you know, anything that speaks to the idea that there's a, some amount of education and understanding what it takes to be an entrepreneur. So wherever we think that one, whichever one that is, or three that is, I don't. I think was actually maybe fits in nine. Yeah, nine. All right, so Rachel, we're gonna make you the, the lead for nine. Thank you for volunteering. Um, and is there anyone uh, who wants to raise their hand other than Oren um, to uh, be kind of Rachel's uh, partner on this? And I see uh, Amy as well. Did I just get kicked off the committee or presumptively added to the committee? Presumptively added. Unless <laughs> <laughs> Eric, oh. you can add me to that one too because I've worked a lot with the Kaufman uh, Foundation on uh, ecosystems. Wonderful. All right. Well, uh, thanks, Rachel, for breaking the ice on that. Um, who wants to raise their hand for another one, Neil? I pledge $100. Um, um, I think uh, either numbers one or three would, would be the ones where I could contribute the most given my current role working for a research university. Um, do you want to, I think three, I'm going to just throw this out there myself, uh, seems more aligned with some of the like non-federal actors. I don't know, um, Michael, mm. Lisa, you are, you are big contributors to number three. What do you think about that? Yes, I mean, it, it's got to be stimulated somewhere. So I think a small group, and I'd be willing, and I'm sure Lisa would be willing also to just keep working at it now going from design to uh, conceptualization to launch. And then just the only way to make progress is to make the progress. <laughs> Yeah, I would like to, if there's room for that, I, would, I could contribute to three as well. I can add my name to one and seven if there's any space or need for additional resources there. Yeah, for sure. While we're talking about these, I think it, it might be worthwhile to at least have a, an idea of what some initial actions might be. Um, so thinking about those of you who spoke up for three, since we're talking about that one, um, and I know that there's like quite a lot of thinking that went into to the network. Um, what do you think some of these initial actions might look like? Well, I, I would say that there are, there's a, a chunk of number three that got, then the appendix that got removed from the final report. So I think starting there, looking at some of those, the appendix sort of fleshed out some ideas, some, some not necessarily in, fully instructive, but at least some conceptual ideas of, of how the network could operate or some of the, the, the tasks that it, that it could, actions that it could take. So maybe starting there, looking at 
those uh, the appendix recommendations and then seeing how individuals or institutions um, like ASU could yeah, catalyze some of those. I would say. One, one, one thing that we could do along those lines is, uh, so we, what we have is an approve, approval by this group of a, an objective with a basic framework with some things that were left out in, because of uh, uh, time and space. What we need is the case statement. Here is what we're doing that basically sells the idea at the political level, local and nationally, at the foundation level, local and nationally. And so this is a, this is a business I live in every single day, which is the acquisition of resources to achieve your objectives. When you have no resources, all you have is the idea. And so, so we, what we have is the idea. That's all we have right now. So we have to go from the idea to an action concept and then a, and then a case statement. And then the case statement then tries to find early allies. And from the early allies, they could be in the national government, they could be in a state government, they could be at universities, they could be in some foundations that want to get these things going because the, it's a very strong thing to, to help get one of these things going. You know, I, th I think we could find all those things, philanthropy, everything. We just have to now put energy into taking the next step. If we take the purely government step of trying to turn this into a policy product, it will not be successful. I think to the marketing yeah. point that Wendy raised of having a really good deck that we travel with, we could also say, and here's one thing that we're doing under each of these things, which is probably not something we're all going to hammer out this afternoon, but if our leaders could take our action steps and say, and this is what we're doing on each thing, that might and that travels with it might be nice. Neil? Yeah, Eric, I don't know if this is the forum for it, so you can tell me if it's not, but as I'm looking on the bottom half of the page, in the middle column, um, entrepreneurial education incentives. One of the things that I've spent a lot of time working on in the last year and a half, I mentioned it very briefly to Christina this morning, and I've talked to NSF about it a million times, is this idea of attaching small businesses, basically SBIR grantees, to graduate entrepreneurship students. So it's a way of both en enhancing experiential education for entrepreneurship students while simultaneously helping small businesses, because as a many-time SBIR grantee where all of those companies need help is on the business side, not necessarily on the technical side. And all of, all of NSF's existing programs, except for i all focus on providing additional technical resources. So I've kind of formulated this idea, but like Steve said, I'm in the red zone, but I can't get it over the goal line. But maybe if it fits with some of the themes here, that might be a way to be able to advance it. Yeah, absolutely. I think figuring out how to make those ideas actionable and actually get them done is a, is a real key of what you all will be doing after after today's meeting on this. Right. Wendy? Um, let's talk, I want to recommend establish a National Innovation Council. That was one that there was a lot of energy around at one time and it made it to the list and that's cool. So number one, we need a charter. A uh, very formal charter for what that might look like. There needs to be a plan for representation of folks on that council, and then uh, a phase of early comms. I would say just to generate enough momentum to then actual, you know, actually bring it to life. And um, then there's like a, a slate of areas that that national council would begin to work on, just to give folks an understanding of what it might look like. So I would be happy to be engaged in that. All right, Byron. Yeah, I think I'd I'd, I'd be willing to to um, play some leadership on recommendation ten, um, systematically providing tools and resources to enable entrepreneurship and breaking down the barriers to anyone anywhere. I think there's a good balance in this recommendation of um, ensuring that uh, there are a wide range of pathways into entrepreneurship that are supported in those places where there's investment going on, the, the core regions, but also to build that ecosystem. And I'd be happy to, I certainly think it's, it should be collaborative with, with Rachel, but I think there's a, there's a distinct enough set of priorities here that I'd be happy to take the lead and work with anyone who would like to. Yeah, I would like to join with you on 10. All right, yeah. and I saw a hand from David as well. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm in the worst position for that. Uh, let's start with <laughs> Oren, and then we'll go to Allie. So I just have a process point, and I may have missed this earlier, so my apologies. It's a little a little hard to follow on Zoom, but although this room is fantastic for AV. Um, uh, it, it, this phase of work, uh, I'm just trying to get a sense of um, how, like what we mean by 
uh, the committee members having next steps. So like, are we gonna talk about when this, this NACI term ends and the timing of like, we're delivering this today to Secretary Raimondo. Um, is, do we just assume that it, it will, like before we're driving to the level of tactics on each of these recommendations and using our time, just trying to get a sense of like, are we, who's the recipient of the next level of tactics? Um, are, you know, are we writing, is this a second memo to Secretary Raimondo? Or is this stuff that we don't need the Commerce Department or government to do, but the 20 of us will just go do good things in the world like Kane? Or like, I'm just trying to get a sense of like, where are we, where are we actually going with the hours? We're <laughs> Oren is being our consultant uh -huh. right yes. now. Let's surprise, just love surprise. him for that. Love him for that. Um, uh, so I think the like short and crass answer is it depends on the recommendation. There are some of these that like very much you all can go and do. You thought it was a good idea. You made the recommendation to the secretary. You can put this together. I think you know Rachel's uh, example of putting together a network of people who can go out into the world and mentor entrepreneurs, um, get people to commit to that, and then actually execute on that. That doesn't require commerce to take any action necessarily. Some of these others do. Well, although and Eric, actually, let me just let me just push back on that for just one second. I, I um, and if I'm not reading the room right, just kick me off Zoom. But um, the, <laughs> the the like. So it's one thing if someone's raising their hand and saying, I'll volunteer to pull together, like we should go, we should, you know, create, the U.S. should educate entrepreneurs. And, and but the expectation is that there will be some federal agency or federal funding that will organize that. And all we're doing is making some recommendations. It's a different thing if what we're signing up for is like, Rachel or Byron are now signing up to go try to educate the nation's entrepreneurs. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing people... I think that was Rachel who signed up for that, not Byron. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, Byron, I just signed you up. But, the, but my, I guess my point is, like, like it, it, there's a question of whether we're signing up to make additional recommendations that someone else will do the work or whether we're signing up to go do the work and just decide that we're in charge of educating the nation's entrepreneurs. And I'm, I, that's a big difference. So, yeah. Oren... Can I just uh, chime in a bit? Um, I think Lisa's recommendation was a, a, a great one, and, and others also chimed in on this in terms of doing some sort of a, of a matrix analysis of who are the stakeholders. Um, and I would include the federal government as a, as a key stakeholder, not, not on the education side alone, but on really informing us. I mean, my colleague uh, Joel Gamble from uh, NS, uh, NEC was here, um, and the reason we wanted NEC to be part of this is because these are also recommendations that are coming into NEC, and they have an opportunity to shape what the next few months and years will be in terms of pushing this. So there, that's one, one idea. The congressional piece is another idea because, again, we need to have the, the dollars, as, as Michael mentioned. Um, this is going to take dollars to deploy. So um, I'm hearing several things, but here's the other thing I wanted to um, point out. Um, we have more to share with you in the coming weeks, um, potentially before, before May, as to the longevity of this council. Um, we hope that we can uh, work towards that so that you all can continue to journey with us um, and also uh, find other um, individuals within the Department of Commerce that are going to continue to help us lift us up. Um, it could be um, another set of recommendations on the implementation as it relates to commerce. Uh, it also could be re a set of recommendations as it relates to the federal government. Um, but we'll work on, you know, identifying what those lanes look like. For the moment, if you could give us some of your trust, it's to, I, at least uh, in this meeting, to figure out who among you want to start at least uh, to shape those lanes of work so that we can then uh, you know, have a subsequent meeting, continue to do the working stream. And I, I commit to you that we'll give you better clarity as to that final product who would be, um, uh, where would it land? So I, I don't want to leave you with the notion that you're just going to do busy work. I want to leave you with the notion that 
we're, we're creating these lanes of where these products will land. Yeah, just to build on that, I think, at least the way I think about it is we've individually and collectively put in a lot of time to get to where we are, stopping and saying, okay, we've done our work, it's up to you, feels like a missed opportunity versus building a bridge so that it's likelier these things you know, continue. And so some effort over the next couple of months to put some more meat on the bones in terms of you know, kind of taking the ideas and, and, and implementing them seem helpful. And this, you know, na this current NACI uh, is still intact until May. And so we don't imagine another in-person meeting in May, but maybe we do have a phone call and go through these 10 and have little updates on what they are. Maybe we figure out there's some way to circulate you know, reports on, on teams. Some, some effort between now and May to, you know, on each of these 10, put some more meat on the bone. If there is momentum, for example, with a National Innovation Council having uh, a few pages on each of these 10 things would be very helpful and increase the likelihood they get traction and, 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 and move forward. So what can we do between now and May to take go from an overall strategy with, with 10 to individual kind of work plans, next steps on each of the 10, and, and then, you know, kind of, you know, in fact, increases the odds that more of these as opposed to fewer of these actually get traction and move forward. And I would just add to that that once we know who the leads are on these topics, we can start coordinating in terms of what our teams are doing and what resources are available. So, for example, knowing that um, that Rachel's leading in on educating entrepreneurs means that you know our team can get Rachel and the team the information that we have on everywhere we are in the U.S. All the programming we have, the programming that you can just use for entrepreneurs if it relates to IP. We founded Women's Entrepreneurship Initiative. We can hook you into that. And so I think it's a good opportunity to have one person lead where we can funnel the information and that that person can coordinate efforts. For example, the ledge efforts is going to be a big one that's going to need to be coordinated so that we're not stepping on each other and so we can take advantage of the work that we're each doing. Yeah, and if I could uh, build on my esteemed co-chairs on that point, you know, stepping back, this report was structured to look at almost like a National Academy study we mentioned, you know, it's a, we're gonna look at findings, we're gonna make recommendations based on those findings. Then there's the third part, which are what are the barriers? And so part of what I think we wanna do, leveraging what Steve said, was that between now and May, let's identify what those challenges are going to be and then be able to, to provide those uh, as um, you know, Secretary um, Castillo, you come up with what are the, the lanes that you're going to be able to further move on. So would that be helpful? Yeah, very much. I just want to recognize that our, our co-chair, uh, Dr. Ponch, is here as well. Thank you for uh, joining th us. Thank you, Alejandra. I really appreciate that. I mean, uh, just picking up from what you were saying, um, at NSF, I saw all the um, for 10 recommendations and the three pillars and the following the four principles, uh, pretty much we have activities that are aligned with all the 10 of them. And um, so, you know, the, the, the point that was made is how do, how do agencies who bring the resources to the table, uh, the collective resources of all the agencies around these the thematic topics, uh, have, and, and Kathy talked about funneling through a single individual, I think is a good way. So they are not all searching in different places what's going on but you have a one point of entry where you know what all agencies are investing in these different you know, areas that you have emphasized in your, um, in your 10 different recommendations. And, um, and I will say a few things in my remarks but later, but uh, I am happy to say that at NSF, uh, we have launched already on many of them. And so it's very nice to be able to show that we are not waiting for things, but even as through the last two years of you know, the conversation that you all are having, uh, it's very clear the kind of things that are, are, are important to us to do, and NSF is pretty much, you know, a, a, quite quite a ways in some areas, thinking about some uh, launched you know, new activities and others. So happy to happy to engage with you and tell you what we are doing. Uh, but the scaling of all of this is the most important thing. You know, all of us are doing some, but the the demand out there is so large that how do we scale this effectively? And that's where I think I really feel that each one of you have a huge role to play. Um, it's not just as a membership of NACI, but actually you are the people on the ground, the ambassadors that are going to make these things still help us scale um, so that it's not becoming a Washington-centric, but it is everywhere. Thank Can you. I ask a per perhaps silly but maybe practical question, and I, I recognize Ali's been waiting a while to speak. Um, 
these are obviously being presented as recommendations to the secretary. Some of them are obviously kind of, you know, a little more general and, and you know, maybe perhaps, you know, uh, unlikely to be disagreed on by anybody. But it, what if the secretary doesn't agree with some of these recommendations, like, for example, establishing an innovation council or an, an innovation network? I mean, maybe it's a silly question. I just recognize that these are recommendations. So immediately sort of saying, okay, now we're going to go do these things before we've heard feedback or official, you know, is that something that we need to think about? That's all. I think just broadly, some of these like that council would require us to do something, right? And so that certainly will go through a process. There are others of these things that you all have clearly said are a good idea. And there are pieces, if not whole recommendations that you really can run forward with. And so, in an effort to just make progress um, in pursuing these and making them real. I think the ones that, that where you can do that, um, that's part of what we're talking about here today. The other part of it is, what is it that we would have to do? Like, what are the things that we would have to do and how can you help uh, catalyze us to take that action as well? Yeah. Uh, also, I, I just don't want to speak for the secretary, but my guess is there'll be support for all 10 ideas, but then the question is, how to prioritize and sequence and what things really are worth using time, political capital, others to try to push across the line. And there might be coming out of it some instincts, but the work we do over the next couple of months may influence which ones are more actionable and movable. Yeah, do you see, because I, I, I think it's a great report. I think there's a lot of great ideas. I love the idea of a National Innovation Council, but all of us loving the idea does not mean that the administration has the bandwidth this year. And so the only thing I would encourage is, as we look at the 10, let's figure out where we could really move the needle in an election year where you're not gonna see new legislation and all that. I assume we, won't ha we wouldn't have anything in this report that you know anyone in the Secretary's Office or the, or the White House would throw up over, but I do think I mean, I assume you keep, you kept the guardrails on there so that we're not doing anything too crazy. But I do think Steve's point is like, what can we actually, there's a lot of important stuff that needs to be done. And I'd rather find the two or three things that we can really move the needle on collectively this year than spend a lot of time on things that just for whatever, you know, justifiable reason are just not gonna happen in the near term. I think Allie, yeah. Thank you. Um, so related to the comment about picking the things that where the needle can be moved, um, I wanted to volunteer specifically on recommendation six, particularly around the first and third suggested actions. I think there is a lot that's been happening behind the scenes and a little bit under the radar in the development of alternative growth capital structures. And so I think there are places where we can both amplify and educate um, that doesn't require necessarily having to be able to enact legislation or, or sort of move things at the federal level. So happy to, to focus my energy and attention there primarily. I'm also very interested in seven and nine, but uh, happy to, to follow the leaders there. Senator. Um, I'll take recommendation seven, but Ali, to your point, I circled six and seven together. And I also think Byron, I should join you on 10 because those are so finally intertwined and then I also circled one and three as being related to those <laughs> so happy to act as support but I think Ali if you take six and I do seven we work together on those so we can keep going all right Aziz yeah um uh so so first I'll put in like my points and then I have a comment about what Dr. Ponch was saying um uh, the, fir the first thing is is um uh I would like to help not Chair um, uh, 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 Byron and uh, Senefer on number ten. Um, uh, I nominate Doug to run number five, and I will help you. Um, uh, <laughs> um, uh, but but I will definitely help you on number five, and then. Um, I'll help on number five yeah. too. <laughs> and then, uh, and then, and then uh, on the. Uh, I, I know this isn't a specific initiative, but uh, I, I suppose like I have unfair access to VC statistics, um, uh, both through uh, my relationship with the with with the folks over at Carta and from PitchBook. And so, under administrative actions, they have VC metrics measurement and analysis. I think that permeates multiple of the recommendations. And so, this is me saying, hey, across all ten, if you need help with VC metrics and, and uh, analysis, uh, please like 
harass me for those because I have uh, access to those um, that I can help you guys with, um, uh, bo both the published and the unpublished statistics side of that house. Um, uh, uh, so, so, so that's my volunteer stint. Um, uh, in terms of my comments for Dr. Ponch, though, um, you know, you know, th this is something that's super interesting to me, which is if there truly is buy-in on the 10 things, then you'd almost expect like a certain amount of kind of uh, completing the circle in terms of like every time like NSF like puts out like a grant, it's like almost evaluating the evaluation of the grant in terms of the 10 recommendations, right? It's like, hey, like, you know, we're about to do like this engines thing and this engines thing ties in with recommendations three, six, and seven. And so um, if there truly is buy-in with this, then this can become a living document in terms of like the constant references back and forth bet between them. And that way, it's like, that way everyone can track in real time like the progress our communities are truly making against the recommendation set because again this isn't really a destination this is more of a habit we want to form for these uh, communities as we move forward and so I, I would humbly suggest that you um, start to incorporate some of the language here Aziz, I mean that's a very good suggestion I think uh, it requires I mean all of us doing the things uh, clearly the the central sort of the warehouse of where all of this gets then documented um, I think commerce uh, taking that up I think would be good and all of us can provide those links to what we think it, the specific recommendations that your addresses are, that's pretty straightforward to do. But having that living document that you refer, that, that, that you refer to, I think it's good to have it, you know, one person in commerce who has this uh, on an ongoing basis, somebody like Eric or, you know, somebody doing that, so that yeah. we are all, you know, keeping ourselves accountable in a sense. Are we really moving forward on this? And, and to the point that you raised about, you know, the buy-in in the White House, I mean, there's 100% buy-in. I have not heard anything other than excitement about what we are doing. Uh, in various quarters. I mean, in fact, tomorrow we have the NSTC signing. Um, uh, and, and, and I find that whether it is NEC or, or any component of the White House, uh, there's only excitement about these. Uh, these 10 recommendations would not be a surprise. And these 10 recommendations, are, would, there would not be any issue about buy-in from that perspective. Um, and uh, the interagency buy-in is very obvious. I mean, if you even look at the programs, the DOE or DOD or, or NSF or, or NIH or uh, you know, all the agencies that put out, um, there is there's absolutely no dissonance here. I mean, these are not, uh, in a sense, you could, you could think of these recommendations as not surprising. You would expect these recommendations, right? I mean, these are all distilled versions of various work. I mean, when I take the work that, uh, that Arizona State has been doing for so many years, I mean, you could pretty much say that all of the things align with this already. So it's not something that is really, um, I, I don't mean to put this down, but I'm saying it's not earth shattering for people to say, oh, what, what is this? Uh, this is pretty obvious. And so the question is, how do we get this done at scale? That's the point. It's not whether we do it or not. It's are we doing it at scale, and are we doing it at every part of our country, not just a few locations? That's the key. And, but that's not a small thing, of course, because Arizona State's been doing this for 15, 20 years, and it's not as if there's 100 Arizona States now, right? So I think, it's, I think, it's, I think you're both correct, and that's a, bigger, that's a bigger thing to bite off than than it might first seem. So, but I, I agree that's where the effort should be. You know, to build on that, I think that uh, you know, as we were working on on the NEON, the number three recommendation, one of the things that we tried to do was set up the success criteria up front, because it's really hard to understand if you've been successful. For example, saying, okay, these things are connected to two or three and four, like Aziz was mentioning, but what is the goal? Is it enough to move the needle? Is it enough to accomplish the goal? So I would encourage us as we're looking at these to really establish what is our goal, at least take a stab at it, because then we can, you know, five, 10 years from now say, yes, we made significant progress, here's the goal, and here's how we're gonna measure it. Uh, I'll, I'll accept uh, Aziz's nomination <laughs> for myself to lead five and to bring our industry into that. Um, I also wanted to proffer uh, uh, help on seven and ten. So I'm um, co-chairing this uh, National Council on Family Philanthropy's uh, annual summit with all these big family offices, but all the tech family offices as well uh, in the land this year. And so, you know, getting, getting some philanthropic support and also family office support for some of the things that need to happen in seven around capital formation and, and maybe around ten around sort of funding a lot of those uh, programs I think we can help with. So uh, maybe to chime in at, at, at my, my hat in the ring here. Um, so coming in with a perspective from industry initially, but also from um, leading now an incubator accelerator in a small uh, place-based uh, investment from a nonprofit perspective, you know, again, I've interested in almost everything that's on this list, right? So I think it's a lot of great recommendations uh, where, where I guess I think it could make some differential input is, 
And I have a clarifying question on one of them, about three, six, eight, and nine. I also just want to draw is that I think eight was written more narrowly than it is in the document, um, just to be careful with that. It's not exclusive to women and minorities, but it's, you know, so I just want to make sure that that's a great domain, so I don't want to, and that's an element of it. It's not, as it's written there, people may misinterpret that it's exclusive to that as well, but. Or it could be, again, that's what could be debated. I'm just wanting to just say that between that document and what I'm reading here, it's disconnected a little bit, so. One just edit I should have mentioned earlier, uh, as we think about particularly six and seven, uh, in terms of expanding uh, capital, I think right now the data and the overall dynamic seems to be suggesting in the next several years there'll be a shrinking, that a lot of venture firms will go under. Some think as many as half will, and some of it because of performance, which is you know, you know, kind of Darwinian. If you're not you know, being successful, it's hard to raise other funds. But some of it is broader market dynamics, people over allocated to, you know, kind of you know, venture and so forth. So in the long run, we want to expand the short run, and we may just want to figure out ways to stabilize or reduce the likely decline that's going to otherwise happen. So it's just something to, to think about. We shouldn't just presume. For example, in the last decade, 1,400 new venture firms started what we call these rise of the rest cities. I'd be delighted if, if three years from now there's still 1,400. I'm worried it's going to be a lot less. If, of course, we'd like more, but, it, but just holding where you are in some cases is going to be a win. Um, I see a, a few orphans here um, that have not yet been spoken up for, which may be to Peter. Oh, thank you. Um, I really Hi. should just turn around. Patricia here for a couple of those. <laughs> Great. Go ahead, Patricia. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, I, I'm really uh, enamored by uh, intellectual property and pulling that into like SBIR grants and things like that. So number four um, is, is one that I've got a lot of interest in. But also getting back to uh, say number seven and, and focusing on... Um, uh, firms that are really impact investors more so than it, when bringing the, the philanthropic capital into that, um, I, I think is very important there. So I, I'd, I'd certainly be happy to help and lead whichever ones you want me to do to go for it. But I'm going to go back off on mute before I start coughing again. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Oren? Yeah, I mean, I'm guessing I, I didn't hear Ian, but... Um, if you need on the on two and four, I mean, we're happy to work with um, uh, Secretary Vidal and her team to to try and get some of those done um, within the university IP community um, and more generally among IP practitioners. So again, I don't know if I can sign them to lead something, but certainly happy to put my shoulder to the wheel on those two, which I think are probably more for me and Ian than most on this team. All right. Well, we'll just take by Ian's silence uh, acceptance of a leadership role on those. I used to work in, in IP at Amgen, so that's why, that's why I'm, I'm right there with you. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so I, I think one of the things that, or to your point about what are we going to do with this um, as we close up this session, um, we're going to follow up with all of you. So we, uh, you all raised your hands. Uh, you did that publicly. Um, we're going to hold you to it at least as much as we can. Um, and so we and the team will be working with, uh, you know, the leaders or co-leaders uh, who self-identified for all of these to identify what those next steps are um, and check in with you um, over the next couple months and beyond um, as you make progress on those. Uh, we want to make sure, um, Peter, I think you made a great point about prioritization. We want to see which of these really have some promise in the near term and which of them are more uh, long term efforts. Um, and then make sure that you all and we together, uh, as well as our broader networks, are, are really pursuing the ones that, that have promise now. Um, so maybe just a point of question, on number one, maybe just to push back on process is, is really having someone from the government to step up to lead number one. I mean, the question is just make a decision, right? Is it something good or bad? And, and maybe it's right to the secretary herself, but I don't know, it would be nice to see, see somebody from, the, from Commerce say, I'll, I'll go and figure out whether this can be done or one of our chairs as well, of course, but who's going to do that, right? Because I think a lot of us would be helpful for that, but we don't think we have the, 
the role to, to go go influence that, right? So, yeah. yeah. I, I was just going to say, uh, definitely we'll, we'll let Commerce um, uh, inquire about this and, and move it forward as much as we can. Yeah. Um, so we are, the Secretary should be with us here in a few minutes, um, and we're going to start with a photo. Um, so in order to keep things expeditious, we'll break here in a second to get you all in place. Um, but before we do that, any uh, final remarks um, from Eric? our... our yeah. If, if, if I just may follow up on what may or may not have just been committed, it would be very helpful if we're all fanned out trying to work on these to get clarity from you at the right time what priorities the uh, department is going to take up because there's a list of 10 or so of these administrative actions and I know you won't do all of them, but understanding what you're prioritizing and as Steve said, what the secretary is putting her capital behind would, would really be helpful to inform the other stuff that we're doing. Yeah, I think that's a great point. That's fair. Can I nominate the secretary to run number one? <laughs> <laughs> and we can take that's, her silence that's, that's as accepted. That's pretty much what's, what's occurred already. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Alejandra? Yeah, just a, just a, a couple of um, closing remarks here because I think that everyone was just very thoughtful and, and not only in the commitments that they, they brought together, but across the, um, the discussions we had this morning, um, very much uh, hear it loud and clear. I, I wanted to let, Wendy, your, your points were well taken, um, but we still have a communication challenge because place-based is, is known among us, but it doesn't necessarily land um, with every American uh, people. So we definitely have a continuous communication challenge to make sure that people understand what these investments mean. You know, there's a lot of excitement on the engines program and tech hubs and, and the like, but it is it's a continuous um, uh, responsibility that we have to, con to uh, make sure that every person um, understands this. Um, Michael, your, your point was uh, very well taken as well. It's not just perfecting the wheel, but making sure that the wheel is everywhere. Um, I, I think I got the metaphor uh, right. But you're absolutely right. In many ways, we work as a pyramid where only the few have that access. So this is the exciting time because um, when we talk about um, economic inclusive, inclusive economic growth, um, we want to make sure that we are bringing in the talent that exists across the country in every corner of this country. So um, uh, very well, um, very well uh, put uh, by you. Um, Lisa, you mentioned and, and Kathy started the conversation and I think we all chimed in on really looking at who are all the number of stakeholders that we need to reach. Um, we have our traditional stakeholders that are by definition here in Washington DC and inside the Beltway, uh, but we need to push ourselves beyond those traditional stakeholders and making sure that, um, to Senator's um, observation, that we're not thinking about how we access capital in the same you know, traditional way, that we're um, considering so many other um, forms of capital and access to capital. Um, I think this, is, uh, this moment in time is definitely going to unleash uh, entrepreneurship in the most creative of ways. Um, not only is the government putting in dollars and needs to continue to put these type of sizable uh, amounts of dollars, um, but it's also at some point we're going to see it all on a map. How does this connect to the broader supply chain? How does that connect to uh, the small, medium, large businesses that are going to need to be part of this next generation of critical technologies? And the formation of the, those products, and to uh, Kathy Vidal's point, not only protecting our intellectual property, but more importantly, um, also making sure that everyone is um, uh, part of that uh, protection of intellectual property and innovations ecosystem. So there's a lot happening. Um, we could go on and on. I, I know that uh, the time that we're together doesn't make it justice, but just know that um, commerce in total, and I'm sure that the secretary will speak about it, um, we're in in every sector of what's happening right now, whether it's broadband, uh, our colleague uh, Dr. Spinrod on, on, uh, on uh, both uh, climate change and just technology in the climate space, um, 
whether it's chips and, and uh, tech hubs, uh, commerce is at the epicenter of it all, I think. Um, but we don't do it alone because we have such great partners like Dr. Punch, uh, our colleagues at DOD, D Department of Energy, Department of Education, Department of Labor when it comes to workforce development. So um, this is a long haul. Um, I, I ask that you stay very, very engaged. Um, tell us what our blind spots are. Tell us what we should be thinking differently. I look at uh, both nonprofit and the philanthropic world as also key, key partners, uh, universities. So um, I can't tell you how exciting it is. Every morning I come to work and it's a new set of challenges but a new set of possibilities as well. So um, thank you for being here today. Also one final remark, on, uh, make sure we, you know, there's alignment around next steps. As, as I said earlier, NACI will continue to exist till May. And the question is, what do we do between now and May? And we've gone through with these 10 and assigned something. And ultimately, as several people said, whether it be the secretary or others in, in the White House, others will decide what the priorities are. But I think it's important that we turn each of the 10 into being kind of shovel ready. In the infrastructure world, when, when money flows, suddenly the ones that are shovel ready projects get funded. So maybe some of these don't move this year, but putting a little more meat on the bones, we're talking about three, four, five pages of, on, on each of them. So if they don't move this year, maybe they move next year. And when we don't lose the ideas and momentum right. of the last couple of years and try to turn each of the 10 into essentially being shovel ready and then others outside of our control will decide you know, which, which to prioritize this year or in future years. But the history on these things, at least my experience, is some of the work done in previous groups some, somehow a few years later emerge and, yeah. and, and get the green light. So even if it, it is important that on all 10, we try to put that extra effort into making them shovel ready. That certainly makes it a lot easier for us to yeah. then take those and, and move forward with them. Um, I've just gotten word the secretary will be here in, I don't know, two minutes or so. So I think uh, we can probably take those two minutes to uh, arrange ourselves uh, in a photo ready format um, since it'll be a little bit of cat herding. Um, so our uh, esteemed colleague Colby uh, is going to be the cat herder. Um, so we could all stand up and take direction from him. Uh, Without I'm further in, ado. I'm in charge. <laughs> Sorry, I thought Eric was uh, in charge. Okay, because <laughs> well, the first line of my points is thank you, Eric, for that introduction. <laughs> so uh, it was a very, very brief general. one. Very so brief one. in my defense, <laughs> you can understand why I was confused. Yeah. Um, okay, so look, my primary message is thank you, guys. Uh, I have reviewed, you know, your recommendations, and they're, they're right. I mean, f for whatever it's worth, if you ask me, <laughs> it feels like if we were to take those steps, we would be a fundamentally more competitive, innovative country. Um, by the way, huge thank you to Christina and Steve for chairing this effort. <laughs> Uh, it's a passion project for both of them, I know that, but you put the time in. You guys have really put the time into this, so thank you so much. Um, and all of you have, and all of you have, but there's a little bit of extra duty that goes with being the co-chairs. So what I want to do with my time with you today, apart from expressing my deep gratitude, is I really want to hear from you. Okay, now you have these 10 strategies, the first five are... I think especially exciting, at least from where I sit. Um, what, how, what can we do in the government to actually make some of this happen? Some of it, I think, requires Congress. You know, like you're calling for these big research and development investments. Why we can't get that done is beyond me. But we have to try. Like fundamentally, we have to try. And hopefully AI will help us do that. There seems to be some bipartisan excitement around artificial intelligence, I think because of the relationship to national security. 
So if there's anything that we can go for, it might be basic R&D for AI. You'll get Republican support for that, maybe, and Democratic support for that. Uh, we've got to fully fund the tech hubs. You know, I, I think you're going to be very pleased with the ones we select and the work that we're going to do there. As you all know, we, and Eric knows all about this, we've selected 31. We're going to down select to put big money into a handful. Um, let's get that thing funded. You know, it was authorized at billions of dollars and appropriated at 500 million. So simple thing, like we could get that done, or seems simple, will be hard, but that's something. Uh, IP, you know, Kathy's here. Obviously, she's amazing, runs U.S. Patent Office. What do you need from us? Do you have a lot of suggestions about IP? You know, let us know what we can do. Um, NSF, where's Ponch? NSF is already moving out on so much of this work, but once again, what more can we do? One thing I do want to put on your radar as, as we think about this is we have just announced uh, a woman named Deidre Hanford is going to be running the National Semiconductor Technology Center. I think she started two days ago. Uh, the first job of that NSTC is to stand up a center of workforce excellence. And I'm going to try to figure out how to really produce massively more engineers, scientists, chemists, researchers, focused on the semiconductor industry. That's a moment, you know, comes out of the Chips and Science Act. S totally synergistic with what you're talking about here. So I guess I would say I love the strategy. I'm sad that this disbands in May. We have to figure out where we go from here. I'm grateful for you. I think it's right on. I think because of chips, because of AI, because of the relationship increasingly between technology and national security, there's a moment now. The co competition with China requires us to out-innovate. People are starting to understand that. So um, maybe we could just use a little bit of time while I'm here to like tell me what, what would you do if you were us and what more can the government do to really enact and move out on your strategy, which as I say, I think is fantastic. One next step we discussed uh, this morning is for each of the ten, you know, one or more people have volunteered. Volunteer being a yeah, <laughs> some were some were asked, and uh, <laughs> some were more willing and some were less willing, but all stepped up uh, to between now and May put a little more meat on the bones of some of these recommendations. We talked about them, trying to make them all sort of shovel ready. And then the other part of the discussion was ultimately, uh, obviously you have a lot on your plate, uh, how do you think of these 10, which ones are, you know, are worth prioritizing? Uh, so our efforts will, you know, kind of between now and May be take these one more step, double click again on, on some specificity, uh, and then uh, figure out which ones are you know, at least this year you know, are yeah. things that likely could get, could you know, could get yeah. traction. Or is it something like the National Innovation Council there's a lot of support for? Is that something you want to push for? Do you think that's something that you know, the, the White House, others would be supportive of? That could move relatively quickly, but obviously there's a few people who have to buy into that in order for it to move quickly. Others are more, you know, complicated and some, as you noted, you know, that require congressional action. There's some things that are, might get done this year and probably more things, you know, would have to wait for, a, you know, till, until the next year. So we still have some more work to do to take these recommendations one step further, uh, but then have to combine that obviously with you and others uh, figuring out which of the 10 really you want to make sure it do happen, you know, sooner rather than later. And um, one of the things that was a theme that isn't really in the report, but it permeates it, is that we'd like to see more cross-cutting collaboration, whether it's across the government, which comes back to recommendation one, or across the country, uh, engaging new uh, demographies and geographies, words we kind of made up today. Um, in one of them, the first one, I think, was... Uh, leveraged from a coffee ahead with Eric. Uh, but going back to the 
uh, Obama-Biden administration, we formed the Green Council. So it's really an innovation council. And we think that's a very powerful idea to get this cross-cutting collaboration. There's probably one person in the room that can help bring that forward to um, the president. I think it's a great idea. So I love the concept of taking between now and May to figure out what are the few things we should focus on to get done short term? What do you need from me and the government to do that? And then there's other things where, like for example, getting tax credits and investments, um, that's a long-term play and, and some of this is just teeing it up for, con for some future Congress. But your idea of the National Innovation Council, let's do that. Why don't we do, we should do that. I will volunteer myself as a champion for that, you know. I, like, w Be before you were here, I nominated you for okay. that job. I've already been drafted <laughs> to do that. Um, you know, Ponch will do it. Kathy will do. It. Kathy works for me. <laughs> Kathy has to do it. So, but seriously, we sh this is a thing we should do uh, because it'll keep innovation on the, you know, prioritization like forever. You know, this town. I'm going to be in politic, but such is the way I live. Um, this town is overrun by big company lobbyists and big companies, right? Uh, which is not good or bad, it is. So innovation, entrepreneurs, small businesses, VCs tend to shrink down to the bottom of the agenda. So putting the council together, we'll keep this high on the agenda. And then we can like foam the runway for the tax credits and the investments and the NSTC and stuff. So I'm completely for that. Did you have a hand up? No, so I, I think th I think this is I think there's some really exciting elements of this report, and I think the guidance, ultimately not necessarily right now, but over the next few weeks from you and your team, if you think that a an innovation council getting the administration together, and I don't know if we need statutory is possible, I think we'd all be all behind that and say let's put our shoulders to that, to that and get that done. I think to Steve's point, if there are other issues that are long-term important, say listen, these not, may not be the short-term wins, but let's spend the time, you know, not just necessarily between now and May, but even after that, really thinking through how we set the table for issues that may become, you know, may not be year one, but could be year two. And I think you have the commitment from members of, of this group to continue that effort. I think getting that prioritization so we can get some early wins, you know, off the, right off the gate, I think would be really important. Yeah. I'm for it. Let's, let's try to get the Innovation Council established. Like, how about by May? Okay, by March. Yeah, we'll go back. I'll go back with the team and figure out exactly how we make that happen, and then we'll come back to you guys with what you need to do. How would we? Do, what is the um, innovation accelerator network? What What's the vision on that, and how do we get that? That was to that was the project that came out of the group that Lisa and I co-chaired, which was the Moonshot Project. And so the notion uh, is really sort of what you said. So. I just want to put this entire report into context. There's never been a report in a science and technology relevant space in the history of the United States that's been as egalitarian as this, ever. So you said earlier, you used the phrase, out-innovate. The second part of that phrase should be, out-innovate with everyone. And so you sit in an absolutely unique position because of your business experience, your political experience, your commitment to public service. You commit, you, you and you brought this group together. We're not a, we're not a government committee. We're not government people. We're people from every sector advising you in this new role that you have. And I'll come to, I'll come to the specific uh, Innovation Accelerator in a second. There's a huge opportunity here where we are right now with the, the, the rising anxiety about the future of the economy, the rising fear about replacement of one's jobs by some kind of technological thing. If some national figure, national leader steps up like you and then takes on this notion of out-innovate with everyone. And oh, by the way, I brought together leaders from all over the country who came up with this set of 10 things that we can get going to drive things forward. And one of those things, the third one, is to launch a national innovation accelerator network, which means that 
every corner of the country, every county, every citizen would have access to things they don't have access to now to stimulate them as an innovative uh, source or an innovation driver. And so the, the, the most important point that, that I wanted to make here is that in time and history, you've got a report that no one else has ever produced before that talks about, you know, out innovate with everyone. No one's ever talked about this. It's a really timely thing. So one thing I would say, in addition to the council or the network or whatever, is to roadshow this thing from your perspective, from you personally, uh, as an idea that then says, listen, we're gonna re we've, we brought all these people together. We, we rethought everything. So uh, Lisa, for instance, uh, drove the, the Moonshot group to now be more specific on how the network might work in a whole new area of technology. So just use that as an example. Yeah, so our idea with, with uh, NEON was to really drive economies of scale or things that are being done, partnerships and networks across the United States, but they're not properly connected to its maximum efficiency. So how do you think about universities and the philanthropic side and VCs, and how do you tie those resources together so it's localized in one place and space, as opposed to every state or every area has different things, and they're not really optimized. And then the second piece was, we have identified that leading technology, including AI, the food system is one that we looked at, has places where going to scale is very costly. And only very few, and a lot of the same folks are the ones that are getting funded. So how do we think about the government or this NEON network uh, driving some of that economies of scale that multiple entrepreneurs in multiple states and multiple areas could use? So it's really about drive, finding those areas that have and present the biggest obstacles in the places that we want to move forward and considering how do we tie different stakeholders together to fund them. So, so, one, so one part of the network would be, and this goes to the AI opportunity with uh, bipartisan support for AI for different and complicated psychological reasons, but nonetheless, you can get the resources. Uh, we need a national computational capability that would allow startup companies to have access to the compute cycles necessary and the algorithms necessary that could accelerate AI derivatives. AI derivative companies, AI derivative things, and so that's part of what this—that's part of what the network was intended to deliver. So, uh, things like that. That's one part of it. So, so when you when you visited our microelectronics digital semiconductor incubator, after you visited, we had a company give us several hundred million dollars to equip the company for people that just come in with ideas. Now that's a tiny little thing in a tiny little place in an isolated desert. Yeah. Uh, but if you had these things at scale, these networks could be very powerful because out innovate with everyone. The people would respond to that concept that you talked about. And just to build on uh -huh. what, you, what you said, I think it's very important that the, the council and this network could help institutionalize a focus on new companies, new ideas, sort of not just assume big tech's going to get bigger because the cost of playing any AI or some of these areas is so significant. How do we also champion small tech and you know the, 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 the next generation of companies, even though we recognize some of these sectors, some of these industries do require a lot of you know, capital. And so if we don't take this moment to, to focus on that, I think the likelihood is the bigger do get bigger and the, it's harder for the traditional disruptive challengers to really emerge as significant players in, in this world, which is not going to create a more inclusive innovation economy, more people, more places, more new companies. And so seizing on this moment, saying something is happening, and yes, it's partly a global battle for around innovation with China and others, but also how do we make sure we have a more inclusive innovation economy within this country, more people and more places, and we're not just relying on our big companies to lead the charge, we're also mandating in some cases that they have open platforms, like in, like in, uh, in the case of AI, <laughs> but also we're figuring out ways, like through this network, to unleash kind of the, the next generation yeah. of disruptors. Yeah. Which, to your point on China, is their opposite. So they're completely hierarchical, no common assets, no, no, no opening up to the society. So we will kick their tails by engaging everyone. Yeah. I agree. This is so good. I like what you said and the roadshow and the message. I need to go back and think about, we need to think about how we use the launch of the National Semiconductor Technology Center, which is going to be well-funded, to 
that could be like a, f a first example of what we're doing here. I got to figure this out because that's something that's funded. It's going to have a workforce center of excellence. It's going to be working with colleges, universities, and community colleges to redo um, how people are trained so they're focused on hardware. It's going to have real money to make investments in and with research institutions. It could just be an example, like a concrete example of what we're talking about. And I think one of the insights from this group here to bring forward is that, that the importance of the regional innovation and the supply chain towards owning those high growth industries of the future. So I think that was something that came up. Quantum, for example, for some of the companies that you know Wendy knows well about, for them to be successful and for us to own quantum in the future, we need to make vapor cells. These vapor cells are made by SBIR funded companies at $10 million revenue max. So they're regional, they impact the local economies, which are great because that's part of everyone, the egalitarian, which Michael mentioned, but they impact who's going to own quantum going forward. So they're really entwined, and I think that was a realization that was quite interesting from this group. Uh, one of the things that I also want to draw attention to is that we do a lot of things across the government which are not highly coordinated at all. So, so, so it's th in this area, in this area, for example, the DI. <laughs> the DIUs of the DOT, the energy innovation stuff, that uh, NIH does some innovation, we do a lot. So the, the thing is that there's a lot of assets that is deployed right now, but they're all going in their own direction. When you talk about a network, first of all, I think we need to get our act together here. Um, to the point that you made, Michael, about you know, China having everything top down, I mean, this is great that we don't have top down, but at the same time, what we are lacking is this concept of integrated view. So, Secretary, I would say that on this topic of innovation, entrepreneurship, I think commerce should be that sort of the, the yeah, clearing, clearing house and make, make sure that you bring all of the assets together where possible synchronization, but clearly there is, there is enough resources there that is being currently deployed which we need to make sure that it is deployed to the assets, the, the, the areas that we want emphasized right now. The second thing I would say is, I second you, I mean, the science part of it on the chips and science is just an authorization. And when is it going to become appropriation? Right? Even without that, with the regional innovation engines, we went ballistic with that. Uh, we launched $150 million of 10 regional innovation engines all across the country. We had a lot more to do. Uh, per, per year, yes. So now we, we got 350 million in co-investments. So there is that co-investment available outside where people are willing to co-invest with us. So it's a half a billion dollar scale right now, right? And then the 60 other type one centers that we launched everywhere, we see the, so when we talk about is innovation everywhere? Absolutely. Is talent everywhere? Absolutely. Uh, you know, are ideas everywhere? Absolutely. But I don't think we are doing enough to energize to the point that Michael, you made, is innovation everywhere and that we are not doing it at scale, and we are not synchronized with existing resources, and we need to make a real pitch for much larger and expanded resources. And um, you know, we launched an air, for example. Uh, to Michael, you talked about computing resource. For AI, we launched an air. It's a $30 million investment for pilot. We got, of course, industry to come in, maybe 10 times more of investment. We were surprised that they came in that way. But we need to launch NAIR to the next level. Again, the same problem. We are stuck. So we talk about competition with China, but we really don't translate it. And I think you and I talked about this the other day. I think we need a Department of Offense uh, instead of Department of Defense, because we need money for Department of Offense as much as Department of Defense. And, and, and I'm, I'm gonna chime in because that's exactly the message that resonates the most on the Hill, especially when we talk about place-based economic, de uh, um, economic development. We are the offensive move. Yep towards everything that is coming, or at least that our intelligence is telling is coming down the pike. So I'm, I'm with you. I'll join you on the offensive, Department yep. of Offensive. Yes. <laughs> the t-shirts are going to be so cool. <laughs> the point about out, <laughs> out innovating with everyone is just, I'm gonna keep thinking on that because it is what enables us to to beat China, to yeah. out innovate them. I right. mean, there are many times bigger government funds. Uh, we talk about AI. I just came from an AI event. I'm gonna go do another one. Uh, you know, they have a 
we are winning, right? We are out innovating them right now. We have to stay a step ahead. But you're exactly right. Like our resource, our you know, differentiation is we have to bring everybody into it and have it be more open and everyone has to be into it. That's where the leverage is. Yeah, that's where the People. leverage is. Yep. And coordinate them. Co coherent and coordinated. I mean, you can actually have an entity that's less than the sum of the parts if they're not working together. Mm -hmm. um, can I put you on the spot for one second? What do you think, Kathy, are, what's the low-hanging near-term fruit for how we can support entrepreneurs with, a, with um, IP? So in terms of supporting them with IP, we've already started a program where, so the vision was to have every entrepreneur certified to get certain key training in the beginning, that they understand IP, mm. that they're protecting their IP, that they're learning about cybersecurity. So we're working with the FBI on that, who has a, a lesser version of it than NIST that's actually affordable to startups, and that they're cautious about who they're taking investments from so that we're not mm -hmm. offshoring mm -hmm. our technology. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a wraparound to protect innovation where IP is part of it, cyber is part of it, and smart investing is part of it. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're working on a program right now where the idea is that we would ask VCs to, to make sure people are certified before they have that first meeting. And to make That's sure that with everything across the government, we're working with Alejandra, we're working with CHIPS to make sure that anybody we're giving money to gets that training at the beginning to make sure that they are protecting everything they do. So we're following the money when it comes to U.S. government. And what we do you think of that? That sounds smart to me. VCs in the room, you like this idea? Yeah, we, we included that basic concept in the Innovation Accelerator in Network. The network, yeah. yeah. Are you thinking these networks would be co-located with universities? Multiple groups, including universities. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's got to be the entire community. Yeah. So you want to try to launch a first hub of a network? Should we try to do that? In, in, in our quest for what can we get done together without legislation this year, you want to try to launch? A couple of prototypes would be good. Yeah, I think we should do that. Yeah. I think we should try to launch a, a couple nodes of your uh, network. I think your idea is potentially you know, broader, obviously, than semiconductors, but if that's moving and has funding and momentum, almost incubating it there, which then could be launched more broadly after. It's just, I'm not saying everything here is semiconductors. I'm looking for a proof point that has money yeah. and an expanding industry. It's, it's one node. Yeah. Can we add to that a diverse hub that allocates some diverse capital so we can get a win for number seven this year, too? <laughs> yes. OK, I've been here like for four minutes, and I have a long to-do list. <laughs> what else? Uh, maybe just a, a point of reference as we think about play space, uh, at least uh, those of us who are near many other states, like I'm in Delaware in the Middle Atlantic, I know you come from Rhode Island, is how do we better incentivize, you know, city, county, and states to collaborate better? I mean, it gets lost in politics so quickly. Economic development's corrosive. And in some ways, we have to watch this with regional tech hubs. Is we're making our, our, our states be competitive, which I think drives innovation. I'm saying that that's all bad, but at the end of the day, we're not harmonizing when we say rallying cry beat China, right? We're not. We're beating ourselves at times. And how do we how do we avoid beating ourselves, you know, as much as we are right now? And and, and to me, it's about figuring out a way to pull together the region, at least regionally across multiple states, better than we're doing today as part of everything we're doing here. I don't have the answer for that. It's extremely difficult. I would say we need to start by finding a couple of innovation-focused governors. I'm looking at Wendy. Yep. You know, Jared Polis is a great example of that. Maybe, you know, one, a Democrat and a Republican, and try to get them on board with one of these hubs mm -hmm. and try to get them to do exactly what you said. I just think proof points are the way to go. Uh, and so, look, it's very, as someone who tried to do this as a governor, <laughs> it's tough. So I think we find a couple of champions, and I think Polis is perfect, and, and, and move on that. Yo, by the way, these hub, these networks, whatever we're calling them, I gotta get the lingo down, the accelerator network, should have a public sector component, right? Like, they should have a state, 
as Michael says, it's about with everyone. That's public universities, city colleges, you know, the whole thing. So I think it's, that's how you do it. And mm -hmm. These coalitions over the last couple of years are being built and are built, right? Where you could then, you're not starting from scratch, in other words. There's leverage, there's some momentum, you're not starting from scratch. No. So, you know, be it an engines grant, a recompete grant, a tech hub grant, you already have a beginning point to apply a unique use case for the network being described. So just a thought, let it stack up, because every time you're starting something from scratch, it's just hard. And, and what we can do, I'm looking at Eric, when are we gonna make the Tech Hub announcements? Some, June -ish? This summer, yeah. Yeah. Summer. So, uh, what we can do, and what we should do, and we'll do it for this group, we will put together our assessment of communities that are ahead of the game, where they might already have what you just said, some kind of hub upon which we can build, mm -hmm. and we can overlay that with where there's NSTC money, and we can maybe pick a few places mm -hmm. where we can begin, you know, maybe there'll be Tech Hub money, and, and we'll, those can be our first nodes for success of our proof points. To try it out. Correct, to try it out. And Secretary, Secretary. Can, can I just say quickly, I think just from obviously from your experience as the governor, even the states and communities that don't get the grants, if they actually still have come together, we should be highlighting that because this is not a one and done type of thing and the best practices for how, I mean, you did it as governor and I think we can show off to other communities how you stay in the game. And Secretary Roberto, yeah. I was going to say that one thing that's so critical, you know, as you talk about out innovating with everyone, is to not um, separate out this sort of supply side talent, the talent sort of workforce from the demand side. And I think a lot of the 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 challenges in training are that we've con we've disconnected them. We have training over here, and then demand is over here. And with the public investment we have, there's an enormous opportunity to bring those together. You mentioned, for example, that the, in the National Semiconductor Technology Center there's a workforce hub. And it's really, really critical that there and everywhere, including places that exist, like the Manufacturing Institutes or the Manufacturing Technology and DOD, that we, there's, there's a real skills-based, right, inclusive set of pathways, understanding what are actually the skill sets here. Because uh, if, if we use the same heuristics of you need a college degree and this sort of thing and STEM education for every one of these jobs, um, we're just not gonna do it. And in fact, there, there are millions of people who, are, who have got most of the skills needed to move into parts of, uh, like for example, um, uh, back-end test and packaging for semiconductors, which we're also trying to reshore, right? And, and without, without that approach, I don't think it's, the math just doesn't work. But with that approach, we could be way more successful than people expect. And so I think that's a critical part of it. And I'll, I'll just add that um, it is, it's that departure point that um, how we've been designing a lot of the grants at EDA. Everything goes back to that workforce. Um, good jobs being a, a, a great example of that. But you're absolutely right, Byron. It's making sure we don't, we're not separating the two. Yeah, um, uh, so, so look, uh, I, Man, music to my ears about the story. About, I mean, about the maintaining the narrative that even the cities that don't get the grants, we continue to you know kind of give them the path forward. Um, the only point I wanted to highlight here was um, part of the magic of what makes this council work is that um, uh, we, we bring in folks from both pr public and private sector together to kind of make that happen. And so as we start talking about like those first showcase cities, I just I, I just want to make sure that we don't lose that element in terms of like um, uh, s some incorporation. So I really appreciated how. How, for example, when Kathy was talking about her initiative, you were saying like, "Hey, where are the VCs here on this? Are they are are they are they on board?" Um, uh, and, and by the way, lots of cooperation there. But you know, many of the initiatives that we have laid out here in the NACI framework, um, they work if we continue to maintain that. So, for example, there are a lot of reporting requirements. There are a lot of things that we want to do to make sure that like you know, um, a, a lot of the um, diversification stuff works properly. And so, I, I guess what you're hearing from me is, is man, we as an industry really want. To to make that work, and so we w just want to make sure that we continue to um, work collaboratively on that. Yeah, when I talk about showcase cities, I'm not saying we end there. I just think 
we have to really make concrete the strategy as fast as we can, oh, yeah. especially if we're going to try to get money from Congress. Yes. It's like, what are, what are we funding? This, this success. Don't you want that in your state? More, more of that. Yeah, more of that. Um, I apologize. No, we need to let you leave, but thanks for your I leadership in putting this together and, and making sure that the ideas move forward and we're not just putting this report on the shelf. No, we can't. Let's commit ourselves to that. Let's, we have a few to-dos to get done before you're officially concluding free. in May, before you're officially free. And then I want to come back with some ideas about how we do these networks. We'll work to the last minute, please, till the end of May. <laughs> Let's get a few things done and then we'll carry it forward um, continuously. So thank you. Thank you, Secretary, uh, and uh, thanks, Dr. Ponch, for joining us. Uh, let me hand it off to you. I just want, I mean, I think I made some of the points. So a few things that we have done, I talked about the regional innovation engines, uh, type ones and type twos, and what is, what is exciting is this concept of innovation anywhere, opportunities everywhere that I keep talking about. We had 670 concept set papers that came for type ones. Every part mm -hmm. of the country, every, every territory, every state, every region had um, their uh, presentations. And we made it very simple. We made it such that it's just a concept paper rather than detailed proposals. And then we, one thing that we did for the first time in NSF is I said, let's make it all public. So people know what others are doing and they can then hyper partner. And so we got a couple hundred proposals. We funded 45 of them in the first tranche. And I went for a couple of the launches, and you'll be amazed by the kinds of concepts, the place-based innovation concepts that came out of it. And then now, with the type twos, and each of them has a million dollars to just seed the ideas. But what is exciting about that is it's not just uh, one or two entities, but the entire ecosystem coming together. In most of these, the governor's offices, the economic development organizations, right. the universities, the community colleges, the startup ecosystem, all of them were involved. In the type twos, um, you know, we had not, the review process itself in, involved venture capitalists. Because we wanted to make sure that these were not just hypothetical, fantastic ideas that comes from the brainiac academic types, like Michael and I and others, and Christina and others, um, that, that it's not just that. It's just about the fact that it is actually has real value and impact that it, can, uh, that it can generate. So we were very pleased because we got several, again, several uh, 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 sort of the concept ideas, and we got 36 semifinalists identified. And I can tell you, every one of those 36 semifinalists are worthy of investment. We had to down select them to 16 and then down to 10. Right? It was a very hard choice that we had to make based on the investments that we had. So these are ideas that are actually there right now, yeah. and they'll be languishing because we don't have the investments to go with it. And so what we did was we didn't want to stop. Therefore, I told my folks that all the ones that we are not funding at type two, let's continue engaging with them and give them type ones. So they don't stop, because that's, that's right. the mistake that we make, is that, that we, we let them go and keep, keep sort of creating those. And so when, with more resources, then we'll be able to continue to build them. And then we did another thing, another program with, with um, this entity called Activate. And with Activate, we have an uh, entrepreneurial fellowships. We have 50 of them, where they have mentors. And uh, these are PhD students who are given two years of fellowships to be able to do this. This is in addition to the I-Core program that we are now scaling. So these are these fellowships, again, there are a lot more demand than what we are able to do. And that's why I agonize over the fact there is so much money between the agencies. If only I can get hold of all of them. I can fund all of these ideas that are really out That's there, right. that really right. is meritorious of those, uh, in addition to what NSF can get. So, and then we also funded certain translational grants for institutions that don't have the bandwidth to do that, particularly minority-serving institutions, R2 institutions, and so on, linking them up with R1 institutions. So the, the Technology Innovation Partnerships Directorate, therefore, which we launched, has already done six or seven programs in a tangible way to the proof points that we are able to show that you know, innovation and, and, and workforce and talent development can be anywhere. So I agonize over the fact that, you know, we still argue about this, uh, you know, uh, about funding. And I think we are, uh, we are shooting ourselves in the foot as a country. And that bothers me a lot. I mean, we are willing to do, and I'm going to say it, I mean, publicly, we are, we are, we are willing to put $10 billion for something that's happening overseas, I'm, as important as it is. But we are arguing about hundreds of millions of dollars, millions of dollars for right here, where those ideas are languishing, and that bothers me a lot. 
But we are not waiting. So I said that we should start to hyper partner, get our partners engaged. For example, yesterday I had Micron CEO in my office. We are partnering with them to the tune of almost $50 million now over six different programs. So we are trying to see how we can bring private uh, you know, industry, venture capital, and local economic development organizations. And that's why I'm very pleased. For $150 million investment in type twos, we got $350 million in co-investments. Awesome. I mean, that's the kind of thing that you want to do, is that the people don't rely on just the federal investments only, first point. Point two, that these are sustainable ecosystems. They can't live and die by mm -hmm. you know, SBARs, STTRs, or the federal investments. They have to already show that this is something that will live beyond the federal grants. So we're trying to work on both these things. So it's not easy. But I can tell you there is tremendous excitement all across the country. So shame on us if we don't tap into it and do something to outcompete and out innovate everywhere. Can I follow up with that? Because that's exactly what we, part of our inspiration when we were talking about Nian was grabbing. So if there were a way that there would be different filters on a sieve, if you will, let's say you're the first filter, but then there's 36 companies that are high potential that you want to see how they grow. So maybe then they go to the accelerator network, like an accelerator in the United States or a university accelerator group, or it goes to the VC's hands and then we take it to the next level. But a system that's already established, so it's really easy for you to say, okay, here's my 36, now it goes into the network to the next level and the next filter, and a way that we can systematize that. So it's not your office or individual offices trying to figure out what to do with the, with the level two companies, uh, but it's already established. I was just uh, gonna ask, um, kind of tapping into what we were talking about before, about the links between IP and about what's going on in NSF and how we can use education. And um, I've done some stuff with ICOR recently, and I was just curious about how, what, what happens after that? So, you know, they percolate up the system, and then they had, they've gotten a little bit of money, and you're trying to support the idea of entrepreneurship. And I'm wondering, it, do you have metrics on where those companies, where, where those sort of nascent ideas from these young people go? And is that a nice example of how we can link people who have more experience to for example, your i you know, bubble, or, you know, the yeah. people who bubble up in i yeah. as a tangible way to make a network. Yeah. See, there's a difference between i and the Entrepreneurial Fellowships, just to yeah. draw the distinction. Yeah. i is about boot camps that sensitize people to what it, what it means to be an entrepreneur, right. and then connecting them to resources, including mentorship and so on, to see how, how, how those ideas prevail in the marketplace, including SBR, SCTR, but also, you know, all kinds of, you know, angel to venture funding. Um, the Entrepreneurial Fellowships are a little bit more intensified kind of an approach. And there, you get much more tighter connection with the venture systems already. So these are not nascent ideas. These are proven ideas mm. that are ready for launching. Okay? The, so I just want to make that very clear. These are not just you know, fanciful ideas that hoping that somehow you know, people will get some traction on this. These are well-established ideas, well-proven. But what is lacking is the ability to be able to translate them That's because right. you don't have the necessary skill set and the environment to be able to take that up to the next level. Right? So that's what we are trying to no, co-create. And that's where I think the, the partnership with commerce is really fantastic. I mean, it's been great working with commerce because the regional technology, regional innovation engines and regional technology hubs should not be like this. They should be like that. Exactly. Right? And that's how we are building this. In fact, we, um, you know, we actually co-created the call for proposals for regional technology hubs because RIEs came first. So we wanted to make sure that the people understood, the community understood. These are not duplications. These are actually part of a hand-holding, a continual, continual stream. And that's, a, that's why I talk about the national level of engagement like that, so that we are all synergized, so that we take advantage of each other's. Uh, so the DOD thing does not happen on its own. DOE happens on its own. I'm sorry. I get excited. Um, so <laughs> Michael knows this. He says, he says calm down. So, <laughs> so, that, so that's, that's, that, that's what I'm hoping that we'll also get in this and um, is, to, is, a, is a convergence. Doctor, may I add to that? I, I think there's a missed opportunity, though, because in the programs that you described, and I'm familiar with them, your, your focus is on training the people, whether it's PhD students through the fellowships and so forth. But I work at a university where we're already educating the people. Uh, that's already happening, and the students are paying tuition for that privilege. What I want to do is figure out how to connect them to the companies that you're granting money to because they're innovative mm -hmm. and they need the resource. And mm -hmm. so, so I, I think there's a big gap there that nobody's filling at the moment. Yeah. I, think, I think we should definitely talk about seeing what we can do to, to fill that gap also. Yeah. 
All right. Well, thank you for the rich discussion. Uh, we have powered through a lot um, in this first half of the day, and I think we've reached a point um, where we know what's next. Um, and although we do have some lunch waiting, I think we can perhaps uh, make our lives all a little bit more efficient um, and have some closing remarks now um, and then move to a lunch and close things out for the day. Yeah, I think it's been a great conversation. As you saw with the agenda, we were going to you know, spend more time on which people are going to take the lead on which items. We kind of covered that, and we also were talking about reflections on NACI as if we were done, but we concluded we're not done. We have three more months of work, so the reflection seems premature. It does seem to argue for maybe a virtual meeting of, of NACI in May with the team to get an update around the 10 things, making them shovel ready, but also get an update from the secretary and, and others, or, you know, what's what's happening with some of these uh, these ideas. Uh, so I do think it's a, a logical time to uh, break. So rather than have lunch and come back, we can have lunch and people can move on to their next thing and end on sort of a, a high note. I think it's been a great you know, great meeting. I think people I know came in, you know, some somewhat skeptical based on some of the comments, like, okay, this is all fine, but what's really going to happen? I think you sense the a lot of enthusiasm from uh, not just the secretary but others as well about moving some of these ideas forward. But I would just, you know, once again say there's still more work to be done. So these ideas, these 10 ideas do have more meat on the bones. So whether they move forward now or move forward at some point in the future, we can feel like we've done the job, not just identifying 10 priorities, but actually putting in place a shovel ready kind of approach that hopefully more can happen sooner, but will eventually happen. Uh, you know, and I think that's really important. So thank you again for your time over the last uh, year and a half. You know, thank you for agreeing to continue to work on this. Some of you may have thought we're done, but we do have a few more months we of work we to make sure we, we finish on a strong, strong note. And thank you again, Christina, for really taking yeah. the, the lead on, on this, in this effort, particularly with this report. Yeah. I just want to echo what Steve said and just thank you so much for the work you've done. And you can see it really resonated with, with the Secretary and with our esteemed colleagues here. So let's work for another three months. Let's get some proof points and uh, move forward. That'd be exciting. So thank you again.